Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Alexio Pico. I'm the managing director of the Circle Group and I'm also the project coordinator of the Docs the Future project. Today we are uh, uh, somehow in a, it's not really a final event of the project. Uh, the, 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 our project is a CSA in, uh, in Horizon 2020, it's meant to shape together with others the, the port of the future in 2030. It started uh, three years ago, more or less. And now we are at the end of a cycle, but as you can, can see during the day, uh, it's, it's uh, also the beginning of another one. Uh, that means that uh, we have uh, something to present and we have a very, very high level panel, uh, with different panels and sessions with uh, high level experts. We are going to present the outcomes of our project, the many outcomes of a CSA. We are going to present outcomes coming from the, our sister uh, and brothers uh, research innovation action projects of the ports of the future, the TRIRIAS. And we have also experts discussing and presenting the different uh, uh, perspective for uh, the port of the future in, in 2030. So, so many things. And the best things uh, to, to start, the best thing to start is first to remind you all and all the speakers to be really on time. We have a lot of content today and we want to stick on the, on the time frame because we need to stick and we want to, to give uh, the, best, uh, the best out of it. And the second is, okay, we have a very nice video. We, we produce it uh, just, we have just produced it. And it is in three minutes summarizing the, the end of this cycle and the beginning of the new one, the creation of the so-called network of excellence of the ports of the future. So uh, if the, my, my team and Andrea specifically could uh, launch uh, the video, I will then, uh, we will then start with the different presentation uh, uh, later on. Here the video, Here is, the coming. video is coming. Docs the Future is a Horizon 2020 coordination and support action project aimed to define the vision of the ports of the future in 2030. It covers many issues from emission reduction to port city relation and simpler digitalization processes. But what does Port of the Future stand for in the first place? Port of the Future delivers value to its customers through operational services that have a minimum negative social impact and are compliant with e EU regulations. So let's look at how Docs the Future defines this concept. To tackle the most demanding global issues of our time, the United Nations sets 17 goals with high-level strategic objectives for 2030, known as UN Sustainable Development Goals. Docs the Future relied on the world's port sustainability program, specifically focusing on its five macro areas, climate and energy, community outreach and port city dialogue, governance and ethics, resilient infrastructure, and safety and security. As a start, Docs the Future mapped 136 projects and initiatives with 35 strategic objectives per macro agenda, resulting in a clear overview of main interest of the port projects in recent years in Europe and further. Next, three tools around the main theme of the Port of the Future concepts were developed. The transferability analysis of the Port of the Future solutions, the Project Common Index, the Decision Support System. Through these tools, Docs the Future aims to inform, interact with and build synergies between the interested parties. Finally, a training package has been created with the goal of transferring the know-how of the three tools of the port community and is accessible on the website. And what about the Network of Excellence? The Network of Excellence gathers the most innovative ports, willing to team up and take action to support the maritime community. The ultimate goal is to develop innovative projects and to achieve the port's sustainable targets based on opportunities from funding programs such as the brand new Green Deal. The core topics of the network are focused on essential parts of the EU Green Deal founding elements. The network of excellence will have a leading role in overcoming present and future challenges and promote ideas of the port of the future. By speeding up the distribution of practical innovations, 
The network will boost the business and the industry. Finally, the network will act as a binding entity with other organizations, such as the European technology platforms, international associations, and maritime clusters. The network of excellence will continue the mission of Docs the Future through organization of digital and physical events, continuous updates on forthcoming calls for proposals and member engagement. Thanks so much, Andrea, and I think it was a very nice way to, to start. Now, let's move to the first uh, session of, the, of, this, uh, of this afternoon. We have some keynote institutional speeches. And first of all, we, we have to thank uh, DigiMove because it's, uh, in a way, a DigiMove port policy project. So we have the pleasure this afternoon to have, together with us, Jose Fernandez Garcia, that is from the unit of, for ports and inland navigation in order to have a little bit of background, policy background in ports and ongoing and future related initiative, initiatives um, of the European Commission. So thanks to Jose uh, for coming. The floor is yours. Please uh, keep uh, the timing. Thanks a lot. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you, Alexio, as project coordinator for inviting me to share with you some thoughts on current trends of European port policy. And um, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate the Docs the Future Consortium under your leadership and, and your team for what I believe is a very good project. It is not only a very good project, but like its sister projects under the Horizon 2020 cluster, Port of the Future, it is also a very timely project. This is uh, very much so because digitalization is, together with greening, very high on the agenda of the current commission. Indeed, among the responsibilities entrusted to the Commissioner for Transport is the task to make the transport sector fit for a clean, digital and modern economy, for which a comprehensive strategy for sustainable and smart mobility is scheduled to be adopted by the end of this year. But let me start with greening. A flagship initiative regarding this policy area is, as you have already mentioned, the European Green Deal. It is at the same time a challenge and an opportunity for the European Union. As important growth hubs and clusters of activities, maritime ports can stimulate not only a sustainable transport sector, but also greening the European industry or energy sectors. Different ways can be considered to regulate the access to ports of the most polluting ships, such as differentiation of port fees, setting minimum performance standards for emissions, or mandating the use of specific fuels. We also need to look at how we incentivize the use of onshore power supply for ships at birth currently running their engines on heavy fuel oil. Some ports have been front runners in environmental matters for a number of years and they continue to do so by providing rebates for the less polluting ships, by deploying alternative fuels for shipping, onshore power supply and liquefied natural gas, and by reflecting on their own role as port authorities in this evolution, how to reduce the emissions of the entire port cluster and how to reduce the emissions as port authorities. In the European Green Deal, we have already announced the Fuel EU Maritime Initiative to stimulate the demand for alternative fuels in maritime transport in navigation and at birth. We aim to present this proposal early next year. The Commission is also currently evaluating the 10T regulation and the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive. Both evaluations will most probably lead to proposals for a revision of these legal instruments next year. When it comes to digitalization, which is at the heart of your project, only last week did the Digital Transport Days co-organized by the Commission and the German Council Presidency take place. This is now the third edition of this important event to the digitalization of transport. The simplification and digitalization of reporting formalities have always been highlighted as one of the key priorities to support the growth of European short sea shipping. Already 10 years ago, the Directive on Reporting Formalities established the national single windows, which have greatly contributed to simplification. Last year, the European Maritime Single Window Environment was adopted, 
which introduces a higher degree of harmonization and data collection and digital formats, enabling to reuse data submitted, thus making it possible to apply the reporting once principle. However, other efficiency gains could still be realized. This concerns, for instance, the optimization of port calls, ensuring a smooth and seamless arrival and departure of ships. This could lead to a better information to operators on when berths would become available in order to allow them to adjust their routing or their speed to ensure the most efficient operations and just-in-time arrival. On the other side, a system like this should also allow sufficient information flowing to the port authorities and operators so that they can best adjust to the expected levels of traffic and cargo. This means that efficiency and connectivity also need to go beyond the maritime sector and reach out to the overall logistics chain. Maritime is by nature multimodal, and hence the integration of the shipping links into the overall transport network is essential. In this context, the evaluation and review of the 10D regulation is an outstanding opportunity to take stock and to adjust as necessary our EU-wide infrastructure funding policy. Port operations may constitute a discontinuity in digitalization or, on the contrary, serve as an engine for digital advancement. There is no doubt that we need to embrace digitalization. It is an increasingly important driver for efficiency, simplification, and lowering of costs. It increases the efficiency of our transport systems and logistics chains, as well as the utilization of existing resources and infrastructures. It optimizes supply chain visibility and resilience, improves safety and security, and enhances environmental performance of transport and logistics operations. It contributes to cutting administrative burden, and it allows for much better integration of all types of transport so that users can easily mix and match transport modes according to their needs, leading to general multimodality. The digital transition will help us redesign our economy, make our industry more competitive, and find new solutions to societal changes. These messages should also resonate with the port community. I remain convinced that ports are and will stay at the heart of our transport system and that seaports preserve and embody the outstanding European maritime heritage. I do hope that the results of your work within the Docs the Future project will endure and that you will inspire other consortia for projects that are yet to come. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. And uh, we, we really hope that uh, we can inspire uh, future um, projects also with the with the tools that we we are going to present uh, later on now we move to Ainia and we move to our project officer uh, Sergio Escriba um, I think we had a very uh, very good cooperation since the very beginning uh, Sergio was really helpful to to steer the project also in the right direction accommodating also the, 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 the little changes that are always needed for the project to be really you know, successful uh, at the end. So uh, Sergio, we want to, um, to, to know something about you, highlighting uh, you know, what, what you think about our Docs the Future project and um, also you know, making reference to how we can inspire the next future uh, funding opportunities. So Sergio, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Alexio, for these kind words, for this introduction. It has been my pleasure to cooperate with you in the implementation of this uh, CSA. Uh, it has been a long journey since January 2018 that uh, you started with a duration of 35 months. You have been successful in meeting the objectives of a CSA, which uh, typically are networking, clustering at sectorial level, also management of knowledge and policy recommendations. But this CSA, Docs the Future, has gone a bit beyond those standard objectives and have produced also some tangible outcomes that we will know along this conference. Um, I will review a, a bit how has been the, the way, the methodology used by this project. The outcomes will touch a bit. And then I will conclude with some next steps. So as you said, there are some more funding opportunities in line with the, with the intention, the strategy followed in this CSA. 
the overall goal of the docs the future uh, is of course to build the vision of the ports uh, in a, in a horizon time and the long term but uh, to be more practical to improve the environmental performance of ports and this is in line with the eu policy goals those mentioned by jose before and also the united nations sustainability goals there are many areas to work with in the port sector to improve the environmental performance this project is addressing dredging emission reductions energy transition electrification smart grids port city interfaces and the use of renewable energy management among others in practice the methodology followed by this project I, I would group it into three three big steps three set of outcomes the first one the project approach during the beginning the first period uh, the definition of the objective so where do we want to go what are the objectives and then the project prepare a definition of the ports of the future concept downscaling from the high level political objectives to a specific technical objectives so what can be improved in the project to to also to improve the environmental performance the technology needs were identified thanks to a successful contact with the port stakeholders this is the first step the second one is the how so how do we achieve those objectives with the technologies that are available in the market and also with the results coming from previous uh, research projects. So the project, the CSA, Docs the Future, made a very good exploration of what is on the table, what are our tools to work with. The project prepared an evaluation methodology for these uh, results, for these solutions, based on KPIs. And then the project has also suggested certain strategies from uh, for implementation. In practice, there are contributions for uh, policymakers, for example, the RNI policy recommendations that fed directly the Commission policies, and also I am aware some national uh, innovation uh, owners are using those recommendations for drafting future policies. Uh, summary document that you will find in the website is the Ports of the Future Roadmap for 2030, which can be used by any policymaker to think about the needs of the port sector. A second group of contribution is the, the tools, the smart tools for evaluation of project solutions. Uh, for example, the project common index that you will know later on by one of the speakers, the transferability analysis tools as well for post of the future solutions and the decision support system. As said, you will know more details with uh, some speakers later on. Another contribution is the training package. So these tools are, in some cases not so evident to you so there was a need also to present these tools these strategies in a, in a familiar way and in order to understand the methodology and to to guide the end users with these new tools and the third and last step that the project has been facing over the last year is trying to maximize the impact so once you once we have some results some methodologies it is time to get the acceptance by the port stakeholders and this builds on the common understanding that uh, that has been achieved through conversation with the many type of uh, stakeholders through the creation of the ports of the future network of excellence this is the group of end users that at the end of the day uh, will take these solutions and will implement into the respective port authorities the the project have also worked with the technology providers trying to cluster with the scientific community networking with the other projects and cross fertilization of results uh, from projects working on the same area and in that sense this csa have also worked hand by hand with the three research projects funded under the same topic i'm talking about corealis pixel and port forward it was very successful the way that these three research and the docs the future csa have collaborated have participated together in uh, special sessions in many interesting uh, international events but the feedback the results are also addressing the general public citizens 
are affected by port operations. We we think about uh, big port cities in which the the polluters, the transport, and also port activities have some impact into the cities and that lives in the surroundings. In, to this end, the project has been in close contact also with association of uh, port cities and have built a good methodology and good analysis of port city relationships on how to address port uh, changes in the way that is beneficial also for the surrounding city. The key uh, for the success of this project has been a sound partnership, so a, a consortium covering a variety of, uh, of companies, SMEs, consultancy, association and academia, covering all the areas of expertise requires imports. We're talking from energy, logistics, port operations, safety, and so on and so forth, and also supported by some subcontractors. And it's worth it to mention them as well, which bring uh, important knowledge on port city relations, sustainability, and software development. This has been a successful journey, but this is just the end of the beginning. As Alexio said, this is just an, an inflection point. So the CSA has identified the technologies, the implementation strategy. Now it is time to put hands on and to make this port improvement a reality. You will find, you will always find EU support to this end. The Commission is fully committed with environmental protection, with the mitigation of climate change effects. And the example is the Green Deal call, which aims to make Europe climate neutral by 2050, while keeping an eye, boosting the economy, also through green technology and sustainable industry. Uh, the EU budget for the long-term uh, commitment with the Green Deal uh, objectives is 500 billion euros. Um, but there, has, there is already some commitment in the ongoing the programs, for example, in Horizon 2020, uh, I have to say that there is uh, the first call for proposal open for the Green Deal package. And uh, I want to highlight the topic 5.1 that is about green airports and ports as multimodal hubs for sustainable and smart mobility. The call for proposal is open. The deadline is 25 January 2021. The budget allocated is 100 million euros, and we are looking for big projects in the size from 15 to 25 million euros. At least there will be two projects funded in the ports of topic. So I encourage you to look at the topic, to contact stakeholders and try to cooperate in one of these uh, proposals that at the end may be uh, projects uh, that will be implemented fully in line with the objectives of the CSA uh, Docs the Future. Thank you. These are my, my introductions. I give you the floor back, uh, Alexio. Thanks a lot, um, um, Sergio. Thanks for the kind, uh, for kind words. Uh, it, it was a, a long journey, uh, it, it is true. And uh, just to, to frame a little bit uh, the rest of the day before moving to the next um, panelist, uh, I would say that uh, we, um, we, we, we created a number of uh, tools that uh, are in principle meant to be used also later on. Uh, you will see uh, some of them uh, in the in the session, the specific session, the, the project common index that is meant to have uh, an assessment under uh, the strategic objectives that we grouped under five macro areas rela in, related to UN SDGs, uh, how to a project could be evaluated using this common index, and then the the transferability analysis, how a specific project, a specific measure could be transferred to from a port to another, and then. Last but not least, the, the, the DSS, uh, how to choose and to, to the, di the different solutions comparing the objectives, uh, taking into account the strategic objectives you have. Uh, but more, there is much more than that in the sense that at least we, we have the, the training package is grouping the different tools, uh, giving the possibility to use uh, these tools later. It is true what Sergio was saying. I mean, it's not only looking at uh, a short presentation or a video presenting the tool that you could use it. It's, it's a process. Uh, it, it takes also time to, to understand how to use it uh, effectively. But, uh, but this is also one of the aim that the Network of Excellence uh, have, uh, has for the, for the near future, to continue to explore this tool. And we have also 
another uh, tool that could be useful that uh, is still uh, uh, in, 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 in the final step to be finalized, that is the, the so-called roadmap uh, to the ports of the future in 2030. This will be an indication on how to, to set up uh, a, por a port of the future in 2030, how to define strategic objectives to engage stakeholders, which kind of measures you could take, how to use the tools we, we develop. So it's, it's a guideline that uh, it could be followed in a way uh, by a port to, to support a port to, 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 to this journey to, to 2030. And um, this will be ready in a few days and will be used uh, later on. The network of excellence, we, we have uh, some ports that join the network uh, of excellence later on presenting their ideas, their development, and also why they decided uh, to, to join uh, the, the network of excellence. Um, we, we've, we fought since the, the very beginning of the project that this uh, network could be uh, the, the ideal follow-up, the ideal spin-off of, uh, of, of, of a CSA. Um, and, and this is what we, we created. And I, I may say that uh, having already 17 ports uh, joining the network, and it was not easy because it was the COVID year and uh, it was uh, anyhow not uh, very easy to, to explain. To, we, we had a lot of uh, presentations, discussions, and ma many others will, will join. And we, we, had, we, had, we had just that today also uh, the, the, the partnership from the association AVP, Association International with the Port, that joined the, the network also. So uh, there, is, there is a lot uh, to be done also in relation to the call mentioned by, um, by Sergio, the green, uh, the green port, uh, green ports one, where I'm sure that the network of excellence could play a role in, uh, in, uh, in, in one of few projects that will be uh, presented. So we are perfectly in time for, to start the, the first uh, session after the keynote uh, institutional, let me say, speeches. Uh, I would just uh, ask the team, because I still do not see uh, Isabel uh, Rickbost joining us. Uh, uh, Andrea or Manuela, can you confirm that Isabel is not there? I, I do not see her in the, in the panel, in the panelists. So if, uh, if you confirm that it's not there, we, we switch a bit. And uh, in case I would ask, uh, I kindly ask uh, Fernando Lieza from Halis to start the presentation and to, to start to, to go in uh, one of the topic, one of the many uh, prospective in terms of the, of, the, of the port of the future, that is the physical internet. That is a concept uh, conceived within Alice, the technological platform for logistics. And uh, I think we tackled a bit uh, this issue also in the port of the future, because of course, ports are an important, uh, are important nodes for logistics. But I leave you, Fernando, to, uh, to give this perspective that is uh, anyhow still be really important for a port in 2030. So Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexia, for the, for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me uh, to join this, uh, I would say, middle conference of Docs the Future because, as you said, this is a, a continuing uh, to the future and I'm happy that we will uh, keep co collaborating between the, the Network of Excellence and, and Alice and we, for, we will for sure make some activities. Let, let me share my screen. I have a small presentation. So here we are. So uh, then uh, I, I'm going to present, uh, indeed, as Alexio said, uh, in uh, Alice, we are focused on uh, logistics uh, processes. And uh, as it was said, uh, uh, ports are keynotes and key uh, elements uh, for uh, allowing uh, global trade and transport and, and logistics. So then uh, I'm going to uh, go deeper in this concept of the physical internet and how we think uh, uh, in Alice, uh, nodes will be evolving and uh, in the in the next future, and and how this will be also support other policies. So uh, just to uh, start with, uh, uh, I'll do a short introduction. Uh, who in, is in Alice, and uh, of course in Alice uh, we represent or we have representatives. Uh, of different types of uh, stakeholders in uh, the freight transport and, and logistics. 
and and that's uh, give us a, a very rich uh, overview of the different roles and and giving users technologies and here in the slide i only highlighted uh, uh, those uh, stakeholders or particular companies that are quite relevant for the for this uh, 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 ports of the of the future uh, subject. Uh, we have some ports, but we have also terminals. We have uh, infrastructure managers and 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 other uh, companies uh, involved as Ali. So then, this give us a, a, a richer uh, overview and uh, and then also an holistic view on on the ports and and the and the usage of the ports from, of course, uh, freight transport and logistics uh, perspective. So then what we uh, are, uh, and going more in deep on our goals in Alice, uh, we are fully committed uh, from the logistics community on how we can uh, support uh, climate change and mitigation. And here in the slide, uh, we present uh, uh, some of the uh, scenarios for uh, how we need to uh, reduce emissions. And then in the right side uh, figure, you can see that uh, if we would have picked the, the emissions in 2016, we could move along a uh, softer or a more smooth uh, uh, curve to the zero emissions. That is the, the objective. But the more we the more we wait, the more stiff the curve will be. So then this means that we need to act very fast. And indeed, uh, in Alice, it's uh, we, when we reach uh, or when we uh, when we uh, look into the uh, Green Deal call uh, or the Green Deal uh, uh, of the European Commission, we look into the climate neutrality by 2050, but also on the interim objectives of 2030, because at the end, what we see is that what we do in the next 10 years will be very, very important for, for reach the objectives or, or not. So then what we see also is that uh, in, in order to transition all the assets we have now to low emissions energy assets, uh, this will take time. It's an uh, investment, it's a uh, capex. So then uh, this cannot be done from one day to, to another. So then we look how we could support this transition and make an impact in the short term, because at the end, whatever we do in the, so for example, if we save one ton of CO2 uh, this year, this means saving 10 tons of the CO2 in 10 years. So. What we look is how we can uh, support the making uh, freight transport and logistics uh, more efficient and try to solve some uh, pain points. And, and indeed, uh, we, uh, this is the, the origin of the physical internet uh, uh, concept. So then it's uh, how we, and that I will explain to you a little bit later. So it's how we can open and connect uh, non-efficient networks and how we can access to interoperable uh, resources. And, and it's, Indeed, uh, I'm very glad to, to have here uh, Mr. Uh, Garcia introduction because everything that uh, was mentioned was indeed enabling uh, to get uh, the uh, benefits of, of the physical internet. So what we did in Alice is uh, to, uh, with uh, the support of all our stakeholders, we define a roadmap to what zero emissions logistics by 2050 that indeed was presented the day before uh, the, the Green Deal of the European Commission was, uh, was presented and we have worked uh, around this uh, for a couple of, of years. And then we defined uh, and supported by uh, previous research uh, five main areas of intervention in which we should work uh, to address the, the challenge. And then uh, here, uh, what I highlighted is that uh, in particular in research and innovation, the current focus is more on greening the assets that is uh, really needed and we need to move into, into this direction. So how we can transition to low emissions energy. But we also realize that there are other uh, opportunities that were not so much uh, work around or it's not that much supported by research and innovation. Uh, it's moving more on operational and organizational innovation. And, and here indeed uh, ports have a lot to do and a lot to say in particular, as it was also mentioned uh, by Mr. Garcia on uh, the role of ports in order to uh, make better use of uh, uh, transport uh, modes that are uh, low energy intensive and low emissions intensive like uh, uh, inland waterways, uh, rail freight and 
uh, also sort C. So the, the role of ports is here key uh, to enable this. And also uh, how the ports can make the, the, port, the cluster of the ports and uh, work more efficient and make better use of the resources. So then every transportation uh, leg that is uh, coming or moving uh, from, the, from the port is always uh, fully utilized and, and it's uh, really maximizing the use of the assets and, and services and also the throughput from the terminals and imports and operations. So this is basically what we think uh, uh, there is a little bit more uh, focus needed. And indeed uh, this week earlier, uh, we released uh, our uh, physical internet roadmap in which uh, there is a little bit more explanation of what uh, this concept is uh, it's about. But at the end, it's uh, only uh, by making better use of the assets and, and resources, we could, uh, the, the, the concept could help us to reach mid-term mid to the objectives of uh, staying within 2.0 and 1.50, only by making better utilization of the, of the resources and, and, the, and, and making better use of the infrastructure. So then uh, we developed this, uh, this roadmap uh, that uh, had a participation, not only from the academic world, but also in particularly from the industry. So then the idea was to make this uh, concept uh, appealing and, and also uh, trans translate this academic concept into a industry workable uh, concept. And then we defined uh, five areas of intervention, uh, logistics nodes, logistics networks, the system of logistics networks, then access and adoption and, and governance. And for ports, particularly interesting uh, logistics nodes that I, I will uh, explain a little bit more in detail. And then what we uh, have, uh, uh, what we realize or what we have uh, 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 indeed, ambition is that uh, this transition uh, started already uh, five years ago. So then there is uh, some uh, work ongoing. And then from 2020 to 2030, we have defined different evolutions and generations of the different uh, areas uh, towards 2030, where we think there will be uh, mainly uh, industry implementations into the, into the, into the operations. And then uh, we envisioned concrete benefits uh, on moving around these uh, generations. And uh, also we uh, envision when we arrive 20, 2030, we'll have the uh, first pilot implementations in operations, but still there will be room for improvement until 2040 in terms of uh, automated and autonomous uh, operations. And then what we included is uh, also in the roadmap uh, what we want to achieve by 2030 and 2040 and what or what the next steps could look like. So then in terms of, uh, as I said, uh, I, I'll explain more the logistics uh, uh, nodes. And, and here what we see is that, uh, and this is particularly interesting for, uh, for our uh, the, the end users uh, and uh, for transportation companies, freight forwarders and, and shippers, they need to uh, operate uh, in with uh, and work together and collaborate with many ports, many terminals uh, all over the world for their uh, transportation and 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 uh, for their logistics uh, chains. And and the, the, here the idea is that how these logistics nodes that are at the end ports, airports, uh, warehouses, distribution centers can define the services and, and processes in a, in a more standardized way. So then at the end, the, the way the, the platforms or the companies interact with the platforms and TCS of the, of the ports are uh, more or less harmonized or the same. So then they don't need to build as many interoperability capabilities as ports they are working with or as for stakeholders they are working with. So then it's how to define these standard processes and, and protocols. So then once you can, uh, you have this defined in your system, you can connect to uh, every port or every terminal for that particular process that it's standardized. Then the second part, it's on how you uh, and the ports uh, 
uh, nucleate a number of uh, stakeholders, a number of services, so how you can really provide visibility of those services and accessibility to the stakeholders using those services and, and make this uh, digitally accessible. And, and then also to enable a business collaboration and business models across these networks. And here, for example, we have some uh, good initiatives in Port of Antwerp on, with Nextport or Port Base or Port of Valencia that are evolving their port community systems uh, and, and make them um, uh, like port community systems dot put dot two dot zero. So then they, they enable uh, additional uh, services and also interconnectivity with other uh, information sharing platforms, uh, name them freight lanes and, and all that. So then how you can how we can really uh, evolve uh, these uh, nodes uh, into the physical internet nodes so then the uh, companies and stakeholders can access to those uh, services and, and resources. So then- Sorry, uh, we, sorry Fernando, just, yeah. just a couple of minutes, eh? sorry. Yeah, it, just... I'm finishing already. So then it's, uh, um, then uh, we move uh, in different uh, areas. It's, uh, we start with non-standardized uh, transitment uh, nodes and then, as I said, is how to open the seamless node service uh, offering. And so then very information and uh, capacities. Uh, and uh, so then the stakeholders can better plan and can better access to the resources. Then uh, moving into more automated uh, processes and, and services towards that uh, nodes are really interconnected in the, in the, in the logistics uh, uh, network. So then it's an evolution. And what we see here is that uh, even if uh, uh, we don't need to move uh, from one generation to the other, we see companies and ports that are already working on generation two or generation three. So then there are like different uh, possibilities to, to evolve. And then uh, at the end, uh, what it's important is that uh, on the next five steps. So then uh, what it, we think is really important is on sharing cap characteristics, capabilities and services of the nodes in a and work on how we can define those in a more standardized uh, way. And then implement the federated network of platforms concepts at nodes level, that it's uh, DTLF, uh, Digital Transport and Logistics Forum, that it's also uh, quite uh, important on top of the single maritime uh, window. And, and of course, the identification of business models and how to define trusted data sharing platforms around ports and nodes in clusters. And just to finish, the, uh, if you want to have more information about this, uh, uh, here you have some links that uh, will be with the, with the presentation. And just uh, uh, to conclude, uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And, and if you want to go fast, uh, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think the network of uh, excellence and Alice are good examples on trying to go together. Thank you very much, Fernando. That that's really true. Uh, it, um, I would I would be very happy if the network of excellence in a, in a couple of years will uh, let's say uh, reach the, the level of uh, success uh, of Alice in terms of uh, a vision, in terms of uh, having a lot of uh, uh, core stakeholders to work together. So thanks for this. <laughs> for this. So uh, we move back to now to a, a little bit broader perspective uh, in terms of how. Uh, ports could uh, could uh, see at the at the overall green deal objectives we have the pleasure to have the secretary general of, of uh, the european seaport organization uh, mrs I isabel uh, rickbost thanks for coming uh, isabel thanks for joining us for this ports of the future event and uh, the floor is yours for uh, your 15 minute speech isabel so oh. Good afternoon. Do you see me? Do you hear me? So that's step one. Step one. And now I'll try to, to, to share the screen, um, if that goes well. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll try to keep uh, within the time. Uh, so I did this presentation already for one of your previous meetings, but I'll try to, to, to uh, update a bit with the latest news or the, our latest thoughts. So um, for us, the, 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 for a European ports, the Green Deal is an important, 
uh, I would I say, uh, an important policy. I mean, uh, it's an important policy for Europe. And since ports are really at the center of, of all these strategies, also this decarbonization strategy, it's also very important for us because uh, as it was announced, it, it changes the way we, we produce and consume. Uh, it will change uh, and frame everything in what is happening. And uh, so therefore, um, this whole um, pathway to a net zero uh, continent, let's say, emission area by 2050, is very crucial for European ports. So we have developed a, a reply, let's say, or a position on the Green Deal. And first, we welcome the, the, the ambition. So let us be clear. Uh, we as ESPO, we have been welcoming and also the European ports, uh, this European ambition. Uh, we think that uh, it's important to, to reach it in the most effective way, to keep an eye on the competitiveness of Europe's economy. And uh, we, we um, want to stress that cooperation will be needed between all stakeholders, but also between policymakers. Uh, it's important, as I said, uh, ports are, uh, uh, we, we see ports as a key strategic partner because ports are not only at the crossroad of supply chains, but were, are and increasingly are uh, clusters of energy, uh, also of industry and blue economy. Um, then our third point, before the third point, and this is a slide that I mixed because it's a bit just, just a snapshot how do we see ports with all the stakeholders around, see the complexity of ports, uh, not for all ports this, this picture is the same, but it's, it shows the complexity, but also how important ports are at the center of these uh, strategies. Um, so then for us, uh, if we take look at the Green Deal and also in the Green Deal, the greening of shipping is a priority and we also support that priority because we also believe that it's one of our, of our uh, most important stakeholders. Uh, we see it as, as a priority. Uh, we also see that the, the prime responsibility is with the shipping sector itself. But of course, we as ports want to facilitate this process. We think that it's important to, uh, to have a big, uh, strong cooperation with the shipping lines but not only with them, but also with the energy providers and uh, cargo owners. Isabella, uh, Isabel, yeah. sorry, uh, we still see the first slide and not in presentation mode, so uh, oh, I don't know oh, what's sorry. happening. Yeah, wait, I'll uh, because try. We still yeah. see... Sorry, so you... you no, missed... no, thanks, 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 Isabel. <laughs> so I, I thought I already had to stop. <laughs> so uh, now the, the, the fourth point is that we uh, think that the best way to go to this uh, uh, energy transition of shipping is to work in a way with, with the kind of roadmap so that uh, we see the diversity of ports, the diversity of uh, maritime customers of ports. And we think that the, 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 the roadmap to achieve the greening of shipping will maybe be different for every port, maybe not fully, uh, but we think that um, ports must, in cooperation with the shipping lines and all the relevant stakeholders, be able to make a kind of um, an assessment of the needs to, to invest in clean fuel infrastructure. And they have the, to do that um, on the basis of a series of criteria and also on the, the segments uh, of um, shipping that come to, to this port or the given port. So we, we connected to that is that we believe a lot in a goal-based approach and technology neutral approach. Uh, we think that is the best way to, to have an uptake of clean fuels for shipping is that you put a clear goal for everyone, both for the shipping sector, but also for the ports. And that in function of that, um, ports can together with the shipping line, see in which lines, let's say, in which technologies uh, to invest. It will be maybe for certain ports and for many ports, certain things will be uh, kind of, will be uh, general, but there might be specificities uh, for, uh, for a given port. Therefore, we really are a bit, if we, we talk, for instance, on offshore, we think that you should also think about equivalent solution who deliver the same uh, results. 
we are open and we are um, uh, air pollution is an important aspect for many European ports, which are also urban ports. And so we, we are really ready to reflect on a specific emission uh, standard at birds in ports. Um, so we have set our, um, to start with a first emission standard being a, by 2030 to halve uh, the emissions uh, from ships at birds and in ports. And so there we propose to, to have a 50% reduction. Uh, on onshore power supply, we, we certainly see it as a, a promising and important technology. Uh, it will play, it ro it will play uh, its role, um, but it depends on the port, on the segment of shipping, and we think it's important to consider uh, some, um, we, we should not dream about it, we should also think about the, the the, the, the green, the grid, for instance, we should also also consider that OPS is only addressing the emissions at birth, unless maybe for the, the short ferry connections where you can also use it as a power to do the voyage. But so we think that a case by case assessment is needed and we have to put it next to other rapidly evolving zero emission propulsion technologies. Because we realized that having OPS and install it in, in uh, like the whole area of a port, it's really not a walk in the park, uh, not from an operational and technical point of view, but also not, certainly not from a financing point of view. Um, for LNG, we, we believe that there is still a role for LNG as a um, in transitional fuel. Um, we, we see that the current uh, legislative framework, the current AFI directive still obliges ports to have these bunkering facilities. Plans are underway, investments are being made, so it's quite, um, how would I say, quite, it could be quite frustrating if that now radically stops. So for us, we also see that it's still uh, at the moment and in the coming years uh, an important part uh, of the solution. Um, on market-based measures and uh, incentives, um, we will not be the ones who will say which one should it be and so on, but for us it is important that if we have a market-based measure uh, that it delivers in uh, emission reduction, that there is no administrative burden for the port. Uh, we also think that the, the, the competitiveness of European ports is important. So we really would look, and we know that there is an issue with transshipment ports. So there we will really need, to, and we, we will ask policymakers to look into that, to see that there is no uh, carbon leakage at, the, at, at, at one point, so, but that we really not deviate important traffic from the port to other ports without any uh, gains in terms of environment uh, and emissions. Then we also um, ask for, um, we see that the review of the energy taxation directive can be an important element in the whole greening strategy, in the whole green deal um, uh, policy and strategy. Uh, we think that there should be a permanent tax exemption, not only for onshore power supply, but for all clean uh, shipping fuels. Um, then what we, and this is an important point that we wanted to address when we were reading the, the Green Deal communication. And I think, and I'm very grateful for that, that already in the parliament, um, I mean, we have some other voices on that because in the, the Green Deal communication, we believe that short sea shipping hasn't uh, received the, the place it merits as a sustainable uh, transport mode. And we would really ask to, to, to more attention for that because we think it's, we still have to recognize um, the um, short sea shipping. If we really want to, to go for a more green shipping, that's certainly the case. But even at the moment, it's a very valid sustainable uh, transport mode. We also ask um, some um, attention for pipelines because we also believe it can uh, contribute in the implementation of certain decarbonization uh, technologies. Um, so then we, we, you know, if we talk about Green Deal, it's about diminishing the externalities of the port in, but the port of all the players in the port, including the shipping, 
but it's also how can a port contribute to, to making this green deal happening, to um, how can it contribute to these renewable energies. And ports are uh, important clusters of energy, um, and, and in that way they can really play an active role in uh, in a positive role in uh, boosting these uh, new energies. Also, if we look at, for instance, circular economy, uh, also offshore um, renewable energy, ports can play an important role. We also see now that ports are really working with different stakeholders in and around the port in uh, developing the, the, the hydrogen. Uh, because ports will also there play an important role in importing the, the, the hydrogen, for instance. And just for you to know is that also in ESPO, we now created uh, an energy network next to our other uh, standing committees. Um, we, next to mitigation, uh, resilience to climate change is so important for waterborne transport and for ports. Uh, ports, as you know, are literally on the on the first row. So the, also the investments and the infrastructure in the port will have to cater for that and uh, to reply or respond to this uh, challenge. Then um, digitalization, um, we see it as an additional or a complementary way of um, um, achieving these Green Deal ambitions, um, coming to a more greening um, shipping sector, but also a more green supply chain. Uh, not only because you can enhance the efficiency, but also because you can increase the transparency. So you can really also, um, in a way, um, you can be more transparent over time, you will know a lot more. And so also the users, the cargo owners will be able to make some more uh, responsible choices. So we think that this is also an element we have to look at. Um, and finally, um, the money. And um, so this is a, 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 an important part of it because um, um, the whole Green Deal ambition and, and making it happen Ports can play an important role in that and want to play an important role in that. We see that ports are, are really at the center of these strategies, uh, but it will require a lot of money. Um, I must not say that in the current period, it's becoming more challenges. We challenging. Uh, as ESPO, our membership has uh, explicitly said we do not want to put aside the, the Green Deal ambitions. With the COVID crisis, we really want to pursue that, but there is no, no time to waste, so ports agree there, but there's are also some no money to waste. And there it will be uh, very important to make the, the right policy choices, the right investment choices, but also to be able to count on, on, on the necessary funding. And this will not only maybe be the, the, the transport funding, but also the, the energy funding, because there we, we see also a lot of uh, synergies between uh, 10T and uh, 10E. So, um, so, and that is what I explained. We, we also see we, we are very supporters of the, the green recovery. Uh, we always, of course, and we are a bit disappointed with if we see the results or the possible results of the MFF discussions, we would have preferred to have more money for, for uh, um, these promising technologies and for this energy and uh, transport issues uh, to make this uh, Green Deal uh, happen. So um, that is what I explained. And I just want to draw your attention to the environmental report of this year that we uh, published on the 10th of November. You can find it on our website and we are happy also to send you copies if you would be interested. And in the framework of that, we have a top 10 of environmental priorities. And I think it's very clear from this uh, top 10, air quality is already years on the first spot. Climate change has climbed to two together with energy efficiency. So I think there you see that it confirms also the importance of the, the uh, Green Deal. So I leave it there, uh, Alexio, and thank you for inviting me. Thanks a lot, Isabel. Thanks for uh, giving the vision, uh, the ESPO vision uh, for, the, for the Green Deal, for, uh, for the ports of the future, aiming uh, at uh, achieving the Green Deal uh, objectives. 
I think what you what you say it's it's really clear and specifically uh, two things. One is uh, the one related to the budget. We are uh, of course uh, suffering uh, also about the MMF uh, for uh, for the reason we know that they are also partly related to the very uh, strange situation in which we are living. But we we have no doubts that together with also a, a good uh, use of next generation EU, this could uh, could lead to really do the, the necessary uh, switch uh, to, 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 to sustainability that uh, we, we really need to, you know, to, in a way to save our planet, but also to do better our, our business for the near future. And then, uh, of course, that is really true what you, what you said in terms of the combination between energy and transport projects. This will be one of the uh, key indication for the future because uh, energy and transport and transport are always uh, again together in the in horizon europe in research but they, they will be prioritized projects coming together also in the ceph framework uh, that means bringing uh, 10 e and 10t together so that that is really true thanks for thanks for for that um, we now move to to the session of the rias we we anticipated before that there was a very good cooperation with rias with the three projects, and um, I, I, I need to not to mix the two, the three names, <laughs> because I, I may I may be mistaken mixing the three names. First one will uh, will be Pixel with the strategic outcomes in line with the Docs the Future. So the the floor is for Ignacio Ignacio Lacal, that is uh, from the Polytechnic uh, University of uh, Valencia for the Pixel presentation. Please uh, take take uh, your precise time uh, in Ignacio and the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexio. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I will try to stick to the 50 minutes uh, agreed. Um, first of that, I will try to share my screen. I have prepared a slight presentation. Yeah. Can you okay. see it? Yeah, yeah. okay. Right. Good. Thank you, Alexio. And uh, first of all, well, to congratulate you for the good work you have been doing these years with the Docs the Future, uh, to congratulate you also for the good video you have displayed at the beginning of this session. I like it very much. And to also um, congratulate the rest of panelists that have presented before me. Uh, it has been very illuminating. Uh, it is always uh, very good to hear about the policymakers' perspective on what we are doing and what we are addressing. My presentation today uh, is about how we have contributed, uh, what we have learned, what we have done, and the good things we have provided to align the ports that are in our projects and the rest of ports of Europe toward the, towards the port of the future concept, actually. Everything began, began at uh, 2018, as you may know. Pixel is one of the areas that was funded under uh, the mobility for growth Port of the Future call, but in 2017. And uh, we had good discussions, we had good encounters, we shared good times together. The three RIAs with the docs were coordinated by the docs uh, of the future CSA. Uh, we see it uh, together, uh, sharing the vision of the ports of the future innovation. We had good times in different events, as you can see in my presentation in a Porto, uh, also together with um, Alice, for example, uh, with, um, in, in, in Athens, we had this uh, midterm event for the future in Trieste. We met together in both organized events by the CSA and as I'm invited sessions in another international relevant events about ports and the innovation in ports, which I've been delighted to participate in. Afterwards, as you know, the coronavirus came to our lives and we needed to adapt to it. So for the last times we have been uh, adapting to this, having our um, meetings, our discussions, uh, our contributions via teleconferences in virtual fashion. It has not been as fun as it was, uh, it was before, but we have uh, contributed, in my opinion, uh, in a good shape to the, to the ports of the future. When we started uh, thinking about what was, what Pixel could contribute to the, to the ports of the future and to Docs the future objectives, 
we realized that the very title of our project and the very objectives, overall objectives of our project matched perfectly the ideas that the Docs the Future as a project defend that the port the future should consist of. Literally extracted from the variable that dot four five from Docs the Future, it says that whenever thinking about what the port of the future must be, two key elements are omnipresent, which are digitalization, digital transformation, and sustainability. Our project, as most of you may, may know, is based on deploying an IoT-based architecture infrastructure for the software digitalizations of ports processes towards reaching environmental sustainability and reducing envir their environmental impact. Thus, we are exactly aligned with the, the axis of this definition. We have been doing, as I advanced before, a lot of actions together with Docs for the Future. It has been a complete pressure to work with guys from Circle uh, and the rest of companies uh, being part of Docs for the Future in all these three years. We started in 2018 uh, meeting all together for defini defining or contributing to the definition of the what was the port of the future aligning the definitions from different uh, policy makers, from different parts and different stakeholders trying to define or helping Docs the Future to define what the port of the future was or should be. Uh, during that time, we also, we also defined our roadmap of, of activities to be conducting during this uh, years in 2019 and 2020, attending to events, having workshop with experts, sharing our visions and also sharing our results on the projects. That's exactly what, what we did in, in between the winter of 2018 and, and winter of 2019, participating in joint events, as I have presented in the first pictures in the first slide, uh, participating in expert discussion, having continuous telcos once it's uh, three, four, six months, we shared our mutual advances trying to align our works sharing difficulties and sharing the good advances we make. Then uh, when the finalization and the outcome provision from the Docs of the Future arrived, we contributed as well for the definition of the KPIs of the innovation of ports of the future in the context of their deliverable uh, 5.3, if I'm not mistaken. And all of these redounded uh, finally uh, before this summer in the assessment of one of our tools, the Port Environmental Index, to be, to be concrete, analyze that tool, assessing it using the good innovation analysis tools like the PC, PCI, TA, and DCS tools that the Docs of the Future uh, generated. These tools will be uh, later discussed and analyzed by the members of Docs of the Future, but we were honored uh, in June this year to showcase the use of those tools employed on one of our main uh, outcomes, which is our port environmental index. As it is uh, just a little bit displayed in this uh, slide, we used the, the tools, we provided feedback and we welcomed all the feedback that also Docs the Future provided to us in order to realize that we were completely aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and with other uh, parameters that Docs of the Future identified as key for letting know that one port is close to innovation, uh, closer to the ports of the future concept, etc. cetera. Uh, we used both the transferability analysis tool and the PCI score tool. We fulfilled with the help of uh, Joris and the other members of Docs of the Future of these tools. And we had this, these results you are seeing in this slide. We were very happy to share this with the rest of the areas. And we are currently in uh, the phase of um, using the final de deliveries of the tools for Docs the Future to refine uh, these numbers and to hopefully in the future to apply them to all of our tools. Actually, uh, 
drawing from the lessons led and the tools that Big Dogs the Future have created, we are planning to apply uh, these tools in one of our uh, world program tasks. Uh, one of the tasks of Pixel, we are aiming to, uh, it's called proof of concept. We are aiming to apply some of our uh, results to external ports and to see how innovative they are. So within our work, we are using these tools for providing some results. So apart from just uh, collaborating with them, we have found useful uh, utilizations of this of these tools actually. Apart from what we have said before about uh, generic alignment of uh, pixel uh, objectives with the ports of the future concept that, that Docs the Future defined, our innovative proposal is completely, completely uh, aligned with different points that uh, from different documents we have been uh, realizing are key for the port of the future. In a brief reference, in a nutshell, uh, the Pixel Innovative Proposal builds upon an innovative innovation backbone from IoT, data, data collector from sensors, from legacy systems, etc. Building upon uh, some software elements we have been creating along the duration of our project, such as port activity models and scenarios, optimization algorithms, uh, merging together with the port ecosystem IoT platform, take, meaning taking advantage of the already existing platforms in ports, helping them to becoming uh, data-driven and data-centric and not, and not document-centric, applying thanks to this uh, inclusion of different data using a specific data formats we have been defining, applying predictive algorithms and analytics, for example, taking advantage of road traffic data, vessels traffic data, AIS information, all of those have, are being also used in, used in the, in which is our, let's say, flagship tool. That is the one you can see in the right of this slide, which is the Port Environmental Index, a tool that is aimed at helping ports, specifically small and medium ports, because it should be not expensive to be applied, to uh, in, first measure and assess the environmental performance and then let them take decisions over this information for improving their uh, environmental performance in different areas. This is completely aligned with the uh, ESPO environment, uh, environmental priorities set settled in 2018, taking advantage we have a representative from ESPO here today. I know this is updated, but when we started in 2018, we already tackled and we have been aligned with eight out of 10 of these top 10 priorities of S.2018. So one would say that uh, Pixel is pretty, pretty aligned with all these lines uh, different entities have been exposing today. To even remark this alignment, what we have contributed and what we have learned from Docs the Future, in the, in the table you can see at the left, this is a struct literally as well from the deliverable 1.5 from Docs the Future, uh, compiling according to them, which are the tools that one that a port of the future should dispose of to be considered as such. Out of those 10 definition, five of them are being an intrinsic and essential part of Pixel. Information sharing platform and our IoT platform, optimizing and digitalizing the logistic change, a collaborative decision-making the port. So one would say we have been pretty aligned and we are aimed and entitled to continue the Ports of the Future concept with the outcomes we will provide when the project will end, which by the way will be next year, after some summer next year. But this does not end here. Aligning this with oh, 2030, 2030, the year 2030 is repeated here because this is the horizon of the Ports of the Future concept set by the Docs of the Future and also the horizon in time set by the European Green Deal call and Green Deal lines. And the pixel, as you can see, is also aligned with three of them, specifically increasing uh, the EU's climate ambition, uh, fighting or striving for achieving a zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment 
in the port side, and of course, being a digital tool trying to accelerate the shift to sustainable and smart mobility. Uh, before final finalizing our presentation, uh, I would like to just let you know that if you want to keep updated with what you, we have done, what we are doing, and to be um, checking our advances, we will be just delivering our uh, web se webinar series starting next year. We encourage you all to join there, also to subscribe to our mailing list. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. This is my contact for any further question you may have. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ignacio. It was a really uh, focused presentation. And thanks for highlighting the, the many, uh, let's say, links uh, you had and the project, the pixel head with uh, with Docs of Future, and in the, in this respect, uh, I I have the idea to invite you uh, in one of the event of the Network of Excellence uh, later on in 2021 to present uh, some outcomes. Specifically, I really like this uh, index, uh, Common Environmental Index. I think it's uh, it's it's a key outcome that you uh, we could help. Uh, you to exploit in other ports uh, through the network of excellence because it uh, it, it is uh, it's worthwhile to do it <laughs> at least in my opinion so th thank thanks you, for Nick. that and thanks for joining uh, us many many honor to be here uh, let, let's move to the to to the next one and uh, the, the, the second project is Correalis uh, Mar Margarita Costo Vasili let's see if I, I did it well uh, from ICCS so the floor is yours for your 15 minutes Margarita Okay, thank you very much, Alexio. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Perfect. Um, okay, so as you said, I'm Margarita Costa Vasili. I'm a project manager in the logistics and maritime uh, unit of uh, ICCS, the Institute of Communication and Computer Systems in uh, uh, Greece. And today I'm going to present you the Coralis project uh, under the title of uh, Sustainable Innovative Footprints for Future Ports. So uh, let's see Coralis in a glance, some uh, facts and figures. Uh, Coralis uh, is an H2020 project uh, that has been submitted on the, under the Port of the Future topic uh, with total duration of 36 months, uh, starting at uh, May of 2018 and uh, ending um, next April 2021. Uh, with total budget of more than 5 million euros. Uh, it is uh, coordinated by our side, uh, ICCS here in Greece. And the consortium uh, is, uh, consists of uh, 70 partners uh, from nine European and uh, associated countries. Among them, there are four research institutes, uh, five uh, port-related partners, either port operators or uh, port institutes and port authorities, four industry partners, three SMEs and uh, one ATS association. Uh, also, the demonstration, uh, demonstrations uh, take place in uh, living labs in five European port cities, including three out of the top five uh, in Europe, uh, which are the Antwerp port in Belgium, which is number two in Europe, uh, the Piraeus port in Greece, which is number four in Europe, and the Valencia port in Spain, which is number uh, five in Europe. Also, we have two medium-sized ports, uh, which are the Livorno port, port in Italy, and the Hamena Kotka port in uh, Finland, Finland. So what uh, Coralis is about? Um, Coralis proposes a strategic and innovative framework uh, uh, supported by disruptive technologies, uh, including uh, Internet of Things, data analytics, next generation traffic management, and emerging 5G networks in order to support cargo port uh, to optimize their operations, to reduce the environmental footprint, to increase the efficiency and reduce the traffic within and around ports, and to promote the sustainability of the socioeconomic development uh, of the port and its surrounding area. Uh, to do so, uh, a palette of innovations have been uh, developed and uh, implemented in the aforementioned uh, ports. Let me provide you a short description for each one of them. Um, so we have the Port of the Future series game, which is a simulation tool for decision making. The RT port, which is a model-driven real-time control module that supports 5G smart terminal operations. The brokerage platform, which is a cloud-based marketplace for leasing and exchanging intraport assets. The port mode, which is an optimization modeling tool for container terminal operations. 
the innovation incubator, which actually has seen the tries to, to make the port the epicenter of the local industrial landscape. The track appointment system, which is a reservation system that includes real-time traffic data. The just-in-time rail shuttle service, which is a feasibility study for key port hinterland corridors. The cargo flow optimizer, which is an optimization tool for uh, cargo flows uh, through ocean, rail, and inland waterways. The predictor for asset management, which is an optimization machine learning tool for efficient use of uh, port assets. And uh, last but not least, the green cookbook, which is a cost benefit analysis and roadmap for uh, reducing uh, the environmental footprint of the port. So here is the matrix of the aforementioned uh, innovations and the corresponding uh, living labs where each one of them has been uh, implemented and tested. So in Valencia Port, we have uh, implemented the track appointment system, the just-in-time rail shuttle service and the innovation incubator. In Perez Port, uh, we have the predictor for asset management, the energy assessment, green cookbook and the port of the future series game. In the Livorno port, uh, we have the port mode, the RT port, and the port of the future series game. In Antwerp port, we have the brokerage platform, the cargo flow optimizer. And in the Haminakotka port, we have the track appointment system, the port mode, and the port of the future series game. So let me provide you a more detailed uh, analysis for some of the innovations. Uh, here we have the cargo flow optimizer that has been implemented only in the Antwerp port in Belgium. And uh, this uh, innovation actually deals with uh, the data multiplexing for cargo flow optimization in order to provide the uh, alternatives uh, for different uh, multimodal delivery modes uh, along with their total distance, time, cost, and CO2 emissions. To do so, um, uh, it combines information regarding uh, the terminal occupancy, the timestamps of containers arriving and leaving the port, and the expected uh, inland mode of transport and uh, combines them with, the inform with information regarding the, the available uh, inland connections and the capacity of these uh, connections in order to predict the availability of uh, inland transport routes and um, uh, calculate the transportation time uh, and the cost and to, pr to promote, uh, to propose the, um, the best, uh, the best uh, transport uh, service. Um, the outcome of this tool is that uh, the, the waiting times of the containers are minimized, uh, as well as uh, the cost, uh, the total cost is reduced and the uh, turnaround times. Uh, let's move on to the RT port innovation. Um, this innovation uh, collects data from both yard vehicles and uh, implanted uh, sensors in order to provide the real-time control, control of operations and uh, um, execute, uh, executing uh, an online uh, analytical processing in order to, to take uh, operating decisions and um, uh, provide uh, update uh, the, the terminal uh, status. This uh, innovation has been implemented in the Livorno port in Italy, which is the, the first uh, European port uh, that has uh, a 5G network uh, infrastructure implemented. And uh, the RT port uh, pro provides a high level of automation for the general cargo management process. Uh, it increases the visibility of the cargo in the intra-terminal operations. Uh, it reduces the number of uh, moves that are required and the total mileage of the yard equipment. And of course, it increases the, the safety of uh, the port yard as it uh, minimizes the, the human presence there. Uh, regarding the track appointment system, this innovation has been implemented in the Valencia port in Spain and the Heminakotka port in Finland. Uh, this tool um, um, uh, combines information uh, from the track side, uh, track appointments, uh, orders and uh, uh, rescheduling and positioning, along with information from the port side regarding the, the capacity and uh, the appointment management and information from the city side uh, regarding the uh, real-time uh, traffic and um, uh, the port-related traffic forecast so as to, to execute the traffic simulation in and around port and uh, provide uh, the estimated time uh, dynamically, uh, the estimated time of uh, arrival uh, for the tracks and the rescheduling uh, uh, of them. 
Uh, also, this uh, assists to optimize the port operational uh, flow and uh, reduce the, the queues at the gates, uh, the port city traffic, and the total mileage uh, run. Uh, regarding the predictor tool, um, this innovation uh, collects uh, and transmits data regarding the, the available equipment and the uh, maintenance schedule of uh, them, uh, pre-processes the da this data and trains uh, an artificial intelligence uh, model in order to predict uh, possible breakdowns of the equipment and uh, help the operators to utilize these predictions so as to, to organize uh, the predictive maintenance schedules uh, to have an overview of the available assets and to optimize the, their purchases. Uh, so this tool has been implemented in the Piraeus port in Greece and uh, provides uh, increased uh, operational efficiency and uh, yard equipment life cycle. Um, as it reduces the, the use of spare parts, lubricants and tires and uh, serves as an inventory for just-in-time spare parts. Uh, up to now, the, the current level of true positive prediction uh, reaches the 85%. Um, so, regarding the Port of the Future series game, this is one of the, the most interesting uh, innovations that have been developed in Coralis project. Um, actually, this is an, a simulation-based uh, game uh, for decision support uh, for medium and long-term uh, strategic decisions for sustainable port city development. Um, the, the user can, uh, can set the, the, the model of uh, uh, the port uh, along with any equipment or staff or sensors or any infrastructure that's available for the port and um, execute some simulations regarding um, different scenarios of, uh, uh, for example, the consequences of uh, climate change and any adaptations measures uh, that have been uh, implemented, or um, energy transition measures and their impact to the board. Uh, the simulations uh, result to um, some uh, KPIs uh, regarding three main uh, pillars. Uh, the people aspect, um, for example, the employment rate, the recreation or the, the safety of the crew and the people that are moving uh, in and around port. Um, the planet aspect, uh, not only in the terms of the ecosystem and the emission, but also the, the, an overview of the climate vulnerability. And of course, the profit, uh, not only in terms of uh, the port profit, but for city benefits and uh, the, the, the total efficiency of uh, port operation. So um, here is the, the expected impact of uh, Coralis project that are totally aligned with uh, Docs of the Future uh, um, outcomes. So have the embracement of circular economy models in the port strategy and uh, operations, uh, the operational efficiency improvement, uh, the yard capacity optimization and the streamlining of cargo flows without additional infrastructure investments. As uh, you, you saw, most of the innovations uh, are uh, application-based, uh, requiring uh, minimum uh, investment on uh, equipment or infrastructure. Uh, the third main impact is the reduction of the port's environmental footprint uh, associated with intermodal connections and the surrounding urban uh, environment for three major transport modes, which, is, uh, which are road, rail and inland waterways. And finally, uh, to, to enable the port to, to take informed uh, medium and long-term uh, strategic decisions and become an innovation hub of uh, the local urban uh, area. So currently, we are working together with the Docs of the Future series game uh, on the transferability analysis uh, in order to bridge the outcomes of uh, Coralis uh, project and uh, Docs of the Future uh, in general. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Margarita. Thanks for uh, taking the time. And uh, thanks also for mentioning the, the, the link with uh, our project. We, I see that uh, you have also a number of outcomes that could be very nice to be presented next year in, uh, in, in one of the events of the, of the network. So 
uh, that, that is great for sure. So last but not least, we go to Port Forward, the last of the three areas. We are almost in time. And so please, Stefanos, uh, take your time also. <laughs> and so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alexio. I uh, hope you can hear me and see me well. Um, let me just share my screen. Thank you, Alexio, also for uh, and uh, all the Docs of Future uh, team to for this uh, for the invitation to uh, to be able to um, uh, to present Port Forward and the um, uh, the development so far and how we can uh, we have already uh, collaborated with all the projects and um, uh, I will try to give you an idea of uh, what Port Forward is about and. Um, uh, hopefully to uh, provide an, uh, um, an inspiration for uh, what uh, the future can bring to all of us. Um, so my name is Stefanos Kokorikos. I'm a co-founder and managing partner in uh, Core Innovation. Um, so uh, we are in, uh, dissemination, exploitation, and communication managers in, uh, in the Port Forward project. Um, so as you will see, uh, our role in the um, um, is uh, to to be able to uh, to provide the uh, the business perspective to a, a research project, and uh, this is uh, how we we see this uh, this type of projects. And uh, um, it, perhaps I think it's it's quite complementary to what uh, also the the other uh, speakers uh, have already uh, presented. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, some first. Uh, um, things about the project. It's about a 5 million investment from uh, the European uh, uh, Horizon 2020 pro uh, framework. And uh, our, um, our vision from the start was to, uh, to provide the tools in order to make the port of the future um, smarter, greener and uh, more interconnected, uh, taking into account the whole um, uh, port ecosystem. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. So, uh, as I told you, uh, these are the three main pillars. Uh, we can we can go to the next one. Uh, say about uh, speak about the interconnected uh, port solutions, uh, which has to do with uh, the connection of the port uh, with the um, the hinterland uh, transportation. Um, yes, Manuel, if you can go to the next one. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, what we're trying to do is to provide the tools to, to be able to combine different types of uh, transport. Um, uh, for, for sure, taking into account the technological uh, breakthroughs and uh, what we can do in, uh, um, from, from that perspective in order to be able to monitor and, uh, and control the, uh, the freight flows, uh, which is something that uh, of course, this period has been quite uh, stressed up uh, due to this uh, to the COVID um, crisis and how it has affected the, the logistics operations in uh, in Europe. So, in the next slide, uh, we'll see the uh, the smart port solutions, uh, which, um, in fact, is what uh, what it, it says about. It's about uh, in, uh, implementing ICT solutions uh, to be able to. Um, to exploit the the power that the data uh, that is produced nowadays in a port uh, um, ecosystem um, uh, has, and how we can uh, we can use this uh, this data in order to produce in insights and um, uh, tangible results for the uh, for the port port operators. And uh, finally, of course, uh, as it has already been stressed out uh, about the, the green port solutions. Um, we are trying to uh, to provide the tools to our ports uh, that um, uh, will enable the the minim minimization of uh, uh, energy usage and uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, through uh, optimizing the operations inside the containers uh, terminals. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Sorry, uh, that's what I was talking about. And uh, of course, uh, save the, the resources uh, of uh, um, of day-to-day -day operations in, inside the port. Um, I can go to the next, please. So, uh, what um, 
what we are doing this uh, for. It's uh, uh, basically port forward is focusing on uh, small and medium sized uh, ports. Um, we have uh, five ports that uh, we are using to validate our uh, technologies. Um, they are, uh, two of them are in Spain, it's the port of Vigo and uh, the port of uh, Baleares. Uh, we have an inland port of Magdeburg in, uh, in Germany. And uh, we have two Italian ports in uh, port authorities, I would say, um, because they are port systems uh, uh, in Livorno and uh, through um, our partner Marte uh, in uh, Naples. And also we have one uh, port that is um, uh, responsible for the replication status of, of the project. And this is port of Christiansand, which is an upcoming um, a growing uh, port um, with a, a clear digitalization uh, um, strategy uh, and it's based in uh, Norway, of course. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see that um, uh, for us, uh, one of the most important parts was to, to define the value proposition of, uh, of port forward. Uh, although we are uh, looking at the proposal uh, projects that are uh, quite um, uh, research intensive and they are uh, looking at innovative features that uh, for sure it's, uh, they are quite far from, from the market. Uh, we are trying to understand uh, what are the, the market situation, what is the market situation, how we can uh, promote um, the research results into, um, into a more commercial, um, let's say, uh, uh, product. Uh, so um, the port forward the value proposition is to have an innovative service platform to create and co-create value uh, for the stake for the port stakeholders. And um, in the next slide, uh, we have uh, some of the of the um, characteristics of this platform, which is a cloud-based platform. Uh, in the next one, it's uh, um, it, it is based on an IoT framework to to be able to ensure interoperability with different uh, uh, systems that are already in place in, uh, in a port environment. Um, so uh, here we have uh, the, uh, the service-based approach to, to be able to, um, uh, to be implemented in, uh, in this platform, either from uh, the port partners and uh, also from uh, third parties possibly in the future. And uh, uh, finally, we have um, uh, user-oriented dashboards and uh, decision supports, support systems that uh, can give, uh, uh, let's say, a, a user, um, uh, from the user perspective, uh, the best possible uh, decision support that uh, you, you, you can uh, in order to, to be able to optimize uh, timely and uh, cost-effectively in uh, the, the daily operations. Um, so how we are doing this, this is uh, an overview of the, of the architecture that we are using. Uh, as I told you, uh, we are using an IoT framework. Um, you can go to the next one slide. Uh, basically from the one side, we have um, the, the legacy equipment of the, of the, uh, of the port and uh, it has to do with um, uh, whatever sensors uh, they are already there and uh, we, are, we are also um, uh, deploying in order to, uh, to get the, uh, the data. And then of course we have the communication systems and uh, uh, the framework of the IoT in order to, uh, to manage uh, this data and provide them uh, later on to, to the central cloud platform. Um, where, of course, uh, we have developed uh, all the different uh, services uh, that we are, um, uh, we are taking. Uh, we are testing and demonstrating inside the, the port uh, environments. Um, the idea here is to, uh, is to be able to, uh, to have a modular approach, to be able, uh, at the end, to have um, a product for a, a port that will be able to choose their own uh, um, uh, let's say um, structure of the of the platform uh, with uh, the services that are more uh, um, uh, more interesting and uh, necessary for them. Um, so uh, we, we can have a look at the at the services of uh, uh, of port forward a bit uh, uh, more in detail. Uh, you can go to the next slide. 
so firstly, uh, we have um, uh, some logistics-based uh, 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 services. Um, next, please. Which are uh, uh, mostly implemented in, in the ports uh, of uh, Baleares Islands in, in Spain uh, from our uh, Spanish uh, partners, Acciona and Leitat. So we have a roll-on, roll-off uh, storage optimization uh, tool um, in order to be able to track the, um, the cargo uh, when it is uh, loaded and unloaded from uh, um, uh, Trans Mediterranean, which is a, a shipping company that is operating in, in the Baleares Islands. And also the uh, way that we are, uh, we are also there looking the working hour optimization of the MAFIs, which are some uh, uh, working uh, uh, vehicles inside the port. Uh, as well as um, uh, we have an outdoor asset tracking, which uh, has to do with, uh, uh, it, it has been modified now in order to be able to uh, reflect to the, to the needs of the, of the COVID crisis, uh, in order to be able to uh, uh, monitor um, the, the movement and congestion of uh, people inside the port and the surrounding port area. Uh, so that uh, it gives uh, uh, insights to um, to the port and the and the city uh, regarding the um, uh, possible risks of uh, uh, virus spreading and uh, stuff like that. Um, so in the next slide, we we are uh, looking at a more uh, a quite technology intensive um, uh, use case, which has to do with uh, augmented reality uh, remote assistance. Um, Applications, uh, which has to, to is implemented in in the ports of uh, in the port authority of uh, Livorno, um, and it has to do with uh, the monitoring of uh, the goods controls uh, and, uh, and the inspection uh, within the the port boundaries, and also another uh, use case that has to do with uh, the assistance of the pilot when uh, piloting the ship uh, inside the port waters. Um, in the next slide, uh, we will see um, uh, some use cases that are impl being implemented in, in the Magdeburg port, which is, uh, as I told you, uh, an inland port in the river of Elbe. Um, so there, um, mostly by our coordinator, uh, the Fraunhofer Institute, uh, IFF, uh, we are building a virtual environment of, uh, of the uh, port uh, area. Uh, where every, every asset of the port is being um, uh, tracked and modeled, basically 3D modeled in, in the first place, in order to be able to, um, to provide a dynamic storage um, uh, space monitoring uh, tool. Um, at the same time, we have um, a, a new uh, use case regarding uh, predictive maintenance of a critical uh, piece of uh, um, infrastructure in, in the port. It's uh, sheet pile walls, which is quite uh, important for, uh, uh, for the inland, uh, inland ports. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, one of the most mature, I, I would say, uh, outputs of the project so far. We have the Green Yard Scheduler, which is being uh, developed now uh, by our partner, Brunel University in London, uh, in the port of Vigo. And um, it is uh, basically a tool that uh, can optimize the, the movement of the vehicles and the, uh, the cranes inside the, the container yard in, uh, in order to um, uh, basically on, uh, on uh, issues like uh, monitoring energy uh, usage and emissions. Uh, to give uh, the, the operator a better uh, overview of what kind of uh, uh, impact the, these operations have. Um, and also to optimize in, times, in terms of uh, um, container uh, uh, movements inside the, the container yard um, to be able to, to have the, the lowest possible um, uh, operations of the cranes and also the, the, the trucks inside the yard. Uh, also, uh, we have in the, in, sorry, if you go to the previous one, uh, in, uh, in the ports, uh, in the port of Naples, we have um, 
the Port Authority dashboard, which is a, a, an overview, gives us an overview of the indicators uh, of different uh, uh, types of operations for a Port Authority. Uh, basically, uh, we are looking at, from uh, the market perspective, uh, operation perspective, infrastructure and uh, uh, environmental um, uh, perspectives. Um, so finally, we have um, an overview of, um, of the partners of the project. Um, uh, this is a, a map of uh, the 13 partners that uh, uh, consist uh, the Portfolio Consortium. Uh, in fact, in, in my, uh, if I could share my screen uh, there, uh, I had another slide, a last moment slide that I was uh, also speaking about the collaboration with the other projects. Um, but of course, uh, from what I saw, uh, Nacho, for example, has uh, covered a lot of uh, what has already happened. I think it, uh, so far for, for us, it's a, it's a big success to be able to to have collaborated so uh, so closely with uh, all the projects, uh, with the lead, of course, of uh, uh, Dogs the Future. Uh, we are discussing with uh, both uh, with Pixel and Corealis about uh, uh, future collaboration as well and exploitation of our projects. Um, even uh, you know combining the the platform based approach that we have with uh, the tools that the other projects are uh, producing. Um, and also using the network of excellence for um, for future exploitation. It's, I think it's a, it's a it's, it's an excellent uh, um, initiative uh, and the output for for a, a CSA project. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was in time. And thank you, Manuela, for uh, uh, for the smooth uh, change of my slides. You're so welcome. <laughs> no problem. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Stefanos. Uh, thanks for um, shaping uh, also what Portful World is doing in, uh, in other ports. And uh, also with the, this uh, promise to, to stay uh, working together in the future for, um, together with the Network of Excellence. Good afternoon again. It's 10 past four. And as planned, we, we move again for the second session, second part of this uh, Toxic Future event. It's uh, the turn now of the outcomes of the Docs the Future project itself. So the already mentioned project common index, transferability, analysis, uh, decision support system, and training. Uh, we have four speakers coming from the partnership, from the consortium. And please, you especially <laughs> take your time, the precise time to to finish your presentation. The first one is uh, Sonke March, ISL. And uh, the, the topic is the, the Project Common Index. Uh, so let's uh, wake up, wake up us again, uh, Sonke, with this Project Common Index. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alexio. Um, I will try to share my screen now. Well, good afternoon, everybody, also from my side. Um, um, we come now to the actual project results of the Docs the Future project. Um, as you can see in the subtitle, the, um, the aim of the project was to define the concept of Port of the Future. Um, we have already heard today um, about the various elements that consist of, we have ideas about digitalization, about greening ports, and other uh, very important topics for the future. So this, of course, also needed to be represented by the, uh, by the concept of the port of the future. So uh, very early on, we, we understood and we uh, agreed that the port of the future concept is actually a multidimensional uh, concept when it comes to objectives. So um, in order to, to start grasping this concept, we, um, we approached it from two different dimensions, uh, from two different directions, let's say. On the one side, we had a top-down approach. So we have already heard at various times today about the sustainability development goals, which were translated by the World Port Sustainability Program into objectives and, and, and also projects for the, for the ports, for seaports especially by the IAPH. Um, 
So this already gives, uh, in a way, expectations that are formulated towards the force um, deducted from the UN Sustainable Development Goals. On the other hand, we also did a, a, um, a detailed document analysis of various port projects, port development plans, also EU projects in the port area to see um, what were the underlying objectives there. And, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, projects of the present or recent past to see what these ports are aiming at and, and what they wanted to achieve. So from these two directions, we started to develop uh, the Docs the Future set of, of objectives. Um, we can visualize it another way. We have the, um, the five world port sustainability areas, uh, which are the high level, which is, for example, climate and energy, community outreach and port city dialogue, or uh, safety and security, for example. We have at, at the bottom from the document analysis the various uh, what we call tactical objectives, so objectives that uh, concrete projects and concrete ports uh, try to achieve in a given amount of time. And in between, we de developed a, a set of uh, 17 high-level strategic objectives whose aim it was to summarize all or virtually all the objectives we could find in the project and link them to the five World Port Sustainability Program areas. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of, of what this um, strategic objective is, uh, you can uh, conceptualize it as the underlying objective behind many of the, let's say, more tactical level objectives um, that you can find in, in, in port. So um, we needed to structure these objectives and um, we wanted these, this, uh, these objectives to cover everything which is important, um, but we also, of course, needed them to um, to not just a list of the objectives, but we also needed a structure in a way to measure the impact of various projects in these various areas to have something comparable and something to say to to assess the impact of various projects um, on in the port area. So uh, therefore, we developed a set of uh, performance indicators or key performance indicators, as, as we call them. Um, these actually cover the, the many uh, performance indicators we, that you can find in the literature, but also uh, that you are working on maybe uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the ports. Um, so we, we cover these and we aggregate them to key performance indicators to the 17, which are directly linked, of course, to the high level strategic objectives. And then at the upper level, just in order to have something for comparison, um, we re-aggregated these, so we uh, structured them according to the areas and aggregated them to key performance in the aggregated key performance indicators for each of these areas. So we have a let's say a point score for a project's contribution to climate and energy, which consists of various elements in, in that particular uh, WPSP area. Um, well, the, the structure behind it and all the, the, the performance indicators are quite complex. Uh, so I won't go through all of them now uh, in order to be on time. But I think uh, uh, the next example may help understanding the, the way we conceptualized it, uh, this, this, uh, especially the bottom up approach from the different projects. Um, so for example, we have seen the various port uh, projects and, and some even have uh, made contracts on these basis with terminal operators um, to have a certain modal, modal split or modal shift objective. Um, for example, to reduce the truck share by a certain uh, percentage. So this is the typical tactical objective and a performance indicator, which in, in our project wouldn't be a, it could be a key performance indicator for a terminal operator, but at the more aggregate level that we are looking at, it's just the performance indicator. But this, uh, this measure, let's say, and also this, this reduction of the truck share can contribute to various uh, of our high level strategic objectives. For example, in the, this is marked in green, the area climate and energy, um, one high level strategic objective, uh, which is taken from the UN SDGs is of course combat global warming 
and uh, the, uh, the most uh, well-known indicator for that is the rejection of CO2 equivalent emissions uh, by a certain amount of tons. So what we have to do is uh, to, um, to, let's say, transfer or um, calculate the amount of CO2 uh, equivalent emissions saved by the, uh, by the measure in order to assess the, um, let's say, the contribution of the project to, uh, to a certain area. Then the second um, uh, area to which this contributes is, uh, let's say, we included this environmental quality or more under the port city relationship. So it's more the regional environmental quality. It's about reducing air emissions or water quality, uh, dust emissions and things like that. So we have several um, key performance indicators there. Uh, one of them being the, um, the NOx equivalent emissions. Um, again, by uh, tons per year, you can also um, transfer, for example, particle emissions into into these uh, equivalents and have some sort of nuisance factor. And again, this is. Uh, the same measure, the same technical objective, but uh, contributing to different high level objectives. And of course, uh, as a port, you may also have a productivity. Um, uh, you want to be uh, productive. You want to also uh, secure the capacity you need for, for the cargo traffic and maybe also for cargo gro traffic growth. So um, that would be another contribution, simply increasing the throughput and capacity of a port by, for example, shifting truck from truck to uh, to barges, and then have more space for trucks on your on your highways. So these are um, the the high level. This is the level we are looking at, translating the performance indicators into key performance indicators. When doing so, as I said, we have again these key performance indicators. For some areas, we have have more than one, for even for most of them, and we had um, depending on what the project contributed to. Uh, we translated this into um, into a point scale then per area, uh, which gives you then the possibility of comparing different projects. Um, most projects have a clear focus on a specific, let's say one or two or maybe three different of these uh, areas, especially if, if you have concrete, like small infrastructure measures, for example. Um, of course, uh, EU projects or, or partner projects, for example, they had a much broader vision, so they would have, a, um, a, let's say, more of a round um, figure here, but uh, most, um, most projects are rather focused, so you have uh, these peaks in one or two areas. Um, so the, in a way, this KPI profile already shows you to which areas of the WPSP these uh, projects are contributing to and also by how much. And I think this is a, a very interesting, a very interesting measure. Um, on the other hand, of course, you can also see that these projects may be very different from each other. So you cannot uh, compare all of them among each other. But what you can do if you, for example, know already that you, you're looking for projects that are contributing to a certain, uh, certain strategic objective, for example, uh, climate and energy, uh, then of course you can you can compare different projects and their profile and see which one would, might be an interesting pilot project, for example, for your port. Um, so it can be used to compare uh, different project content contributing to certain areas. But we will also see more on that, I think, later on in in the presentation by Ella Cité. So um, from my side, this is all, um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Tsongke. It was uh, perfectly on time. And uh, I was just reflecting that um, this, uh, the, the KPI itself and the aggregated KPI um, are already a very useful tool to map uh, where a project, a measure, is contributing to uh, specifically uh, in, in regard of the uh, different macro, macro areas that we defined, climate and energy, city relation, governance and ethics, resilient infrastructure, safety and security. So this is uh, quite useful, and I in invite uh, the attendees to go to the to the website, to our website, to to look for more content because 
uh, of course, there is a lot uh, of content available that is explaining how, and specifically all the different um, KPIs are defined there, okay? Then uh, you have to measure them and you, have the, you should have the capability to measure, but the, the, it's already important to have a clear definition, a clear definition how they can be grouped together towards uh, those five areas. So uh, please, if you are interested, go uh, on our website and go into a more depth uh, understanding of this. Let's move to Yoris, Yoris Clay's Port Expertise. Uh, it's the time of the transferability analysis, okay? Once you have defined that the measure could contribute to a certain uh, objective strategy, that is, that is the objective of your port, uh, but is implemented somewhere else, okay, you need to have a tool to decide what to do and if this is suitable. So 15 minutes for you, uh, the floor is yours, Yoris. Thank you, Alexio. You can see my screen, blue screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sonke, and everybody else who gave very rich uh, presentations uh, so far. Um, I will, I just need to click on my screen and then it should work. So I will give you a little bit more um, in depth of our transferability analysis and the Port of the Future uh, TA methodology. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the objective is actually making future Port of the Future projects and their solutions transferable to a wider range of European and neighboring uh, countries or ports in European and neighboring countries. Um, first of all, it is identifying the innovative of a project uh, as an essential impact on the future of European ports, port cities uh, and their relationships. Um, and also every stakeholder um, involved in the supply chain. Making transferability expectations of the uh, European Port of the Future program initiatives a condition for approval by the e European Commission. Um, and this is an ongoing evaluation during project uh, living labs and collabor collaboration between port uh, provide port uh, providing what we call port pairing potentials uh, and this happens actually before during and after the project life cycle there are two parts uh, to the transferability analysis the first one is uh, the assessment of the potential contribution towards transferability so this happens basically um, when a project is initiated and that results in a preliminary uh, transferability analysis score. During and after the project life cycle, you go through a more uh, methodolo methodological uh, evaluation of the ease of transferability. Um, and that should first of all highlight that you have an innovative concept and then further using the Port of the Future uh, TA methodology, you go into um, depth, into an in-depth analysis of all the risks and barriers involved, which results in the TA index. Uh, just to give you a quick overview um, where this all relates to, um, Docs of the Future, uh, first of all, did the desktop, uh, desktop study analysis and then moved into uh, a clustering of uh, projects which were identifiable within uh, Port of the Future uh, framework, um, which actually uh, went back in time um, until about three to five years and identified the projects which would be uh, applicable for transferability. From there, we identified uh, two parts. One is the strategic and uh, tactical objective structure, which was already explained by um, Sonke, and uh, together with that, also the measures and KPIs. From um, the development of PCI, the first part which was happened was defining the adequacy and uh, innovation definition, uh, which is the I score. So that went into the transferability analysis. And excuse me, I have to hit a button, uh, from where the transferability definition was defined. And that goes as DA score uh, back to the um, project common index. At the same time, uh, we performed a uh, PCI evaluation of a number of projects, selected projects from the cluster project uh, list. 
and uh, that provided us the PCI subscores, as we call them. And then from uh, the PCI assessment, you have both the I score and what we call the PCI um, consolidated uh, objective index, uh, together with their KPIs, uh, methodology, scales, and so on, which go in, goes into the a DSS tool. At the same time, uh, the transferability analysis has been developed and the TA score and the TA index, so on the ease of transferability, to which we're going to go a little bit more into detail, is also reflected in the DSS. At this moment, and um, my colleagues from Unige will explain it later, that is not fully incorporated in the DSS tool, but um, is now reflected already in the PCI uh, assessment tool. So, and this is also already explained by um, Sonke. So we started from the five WPSP focus areas and also the 10 uh, AIVP Agenda 2030 uh, goals. So they basically all relate to the 17 UN SDGs and we reflected that upon uh, as the 17 DTF high level strategic objectives uh, which then relates into more detail into the tactical objectives as well as the um, KPIs and their measures. So the first part is um, we have to identify the conditions of relevancy to the transferability uh, uh, of a project. Uh, that's what we call the adequacy concept defined by the motorways of the seas, but adapted to the port of the future context um, which gives a relevancy uh, for uh, port um, areas. So this relates to the compliance to innovativeness. So a project needs to have an innovative concept and has a potential for pairing across other EU ports and or with neighboring countries. We uh, went to uh, the NISHA, NISHA plus six step methodology developed by Polis, uh, which we have also adapted to uh, the port context and their needs and have um, called that the DTF Port of the Future Transferability Analysis Methodology. The transferability is measured from concept to realization. So that means from the moment an idea is conceptualized um, throughout the project life cycle and beyond, so the real realization and deployment, um, you can perform the full transferability analysis. In the end, it should relate to collaborative efforts, what we call port peering, on dissemination of best practices around uh, innovative concepts across as much as possible ports in Europe. So if we go to this uh, further into the conditions of relevancy, the contribution to specific project peering leads to best in class wide scale uh, applications considering TA through risk assessment, recognized barriers and constraints, um, and also going into the details of how you're going to mitigate the risks involved with those constraints and barriers when you go into another port with the same solution or a similar adapted solution. Independent uh, dimension from objectives and innovativeness, we will go a little bit more into uh, detail later on uh, to explain that. So any project owner can run the full um, TA methodology to define, first of all, there can be the project vision and related targets. Um, so it's objectives and KPIs. Um, it can be also measuring the impact towards its hosting city and served hinterland, or it can be um, multiple uh, or one to multiple uh, areas or goals identified in the WPSP. And there is a little mistake I see, the AIVP agenda and, uh, and or the 17 UNS DGs. And for each, their, their diversity um, is about the performance indicators and uh, smart measures. And smart measures, also as Sonke identified, that should be uh, as much as possible quantifiable uh, measures. So transferability analysis, uh, first of all, you look at the innovativeness. Um, that is what we call the I-score. So if there is no uh, innovative concept, the I score is zero. Therefore also the TA score is zero. You cannot go any further at that stage, although we will see further on that you still can go 
into the TA methodology um, for other reasons. So to give you an example, if you have, if you are a single port uh, project, uh, and even if you have an I score um, obtained, your TA score is zero because you are a single port project. So there is no transferability at that stage involved in the project. And that is every project owner's right to do so. Then that means that the TA score is far from the same as a TA index. Whereas in the TA index, we're going to look into the ease of transferability rather than the potential. So what is the difference actually? Um, so you have potential contribution towards transferability or PCT, uh, which results in the TA score and is exactly an anticipation or expectation for a potential transferability. Whereas the ease of transferability reflected as a TA index is making use of the detailed methodology we have worked out um, as a uh, detailed knowledge assessment of your project in terms of transferability. Now, on the second part, so using the methodology is fully independent from innovativeness compared to the uh, TA score where you clearly say your TA score is zero because you have no innovative concept or you are a single um, port project. So the different scenarios we have then under transferability can be a multi-port participation projects, such as we have uh, just heard the three DIA projects uh, presenting theirs. So they are going across um, different ports um, as living labs for their project deliverables and outcomes. Then we have process which exists along uh, a project life cycle, and that's what we call the champion approach, whereby a donor port offers experience or expertise and or solutions to assist or guide an adapter port in implementing same or similar solution. So we say it doesn't have to be the same solution. It can be similar because every port has its particularities, its mode of transportation, which differs and so on. So, uh, certain solutions developed for one port may need uh, further adaption um, or lining up to the um, requirements from the adapter port. And then the third one is a voluntary uh, port pairing, um, which is a collaborative engagement between ports to combine its resources during the entire life cycle of a project. So that goes all the way down to uh, from development uh, into the deployment and rollout of a solution as well. The TA project pairing across borders is aligned with the Port of the Future Roadmap uh, Vision 2030, which is supported by uh, INEA for cross-border projects, uh, but also uh, the European Commission wants to see that we align those projects also with uh, collaboration with neighboring countries or ports in neighboring countries. The potential contribution to transferability, so again the TA score or the initial uh, expected uh, potential for transferability, gives here a reflection of our scores. I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, you can obtain those if you want those, but um, it's basically a scale from zero to four, um, of which I mentioned already uh, zero. And the four scale refers to full transferability potentials across uh, multiple ports. Then on um, the methodology, uh, which we then use for the um, more in-depth uh, ease of uh, transferability, that promotes the uptake of the most promising innovative concepts in order to transfer them from their current niche position to a maximum or mainstream application. Each concept is illustrated with good practices, uh, key benefits, decision criteria, and implementation, and useful references outlining the following aims. So they are less of an importance what comes here, but it's basically the um, TA methodology provides a guide uh, towards thinking of each of the areas which have rel a relationship towards transferability. And there can be networking opportunities, publishing effective guidance for all stakeholders, 
spreading the word uh, that you have an innovative concept which you want to uh, transfer to other ports and it may also lay the groundwork for establishing projects with supply chain actors. So if we look now at the TA index, how do we come to that? It's first of all a risk assessment and management um, a tool whereby you define, assess and agree on the expectations from all stakeholders, the common project management and reporting system, or at least um, if differing uh, project management systems uh, or tools across uh, the parties, you make sure that they can be synchronized. Then knowledge and skills, um, you look at the, uh, your available resources, both in the uh, donor as well as in the adapter port. And if that is not enough, you go uh, to um, insourcing of experts into your project. You look at, um, as first of all, set at the expectations of all stakeholders, but then you go into the clear insights and recommendations by those stakeholders and define what their requirements are, what their must needs and wants are. That uh, results in a detailed planning of all uh, your resources. And um, then you start identifying what are now actually the barriers and constraints to transfer um, an innovative concept or any other project from one port to another. So those risks and barriers, um, they go across uh, development, deployment and integration uh, covering data, business models, operations, and so on. And as a last step, you define, of course, and agree on the cost and benefits for all uh, parties involved in a port clearing project. So that results in the TA index, um, which is consolidation of assessment, um, the innovative concept, or just a project uh, which is transferable. Uh, can look in, in its contact with impacts and measure of success contributing to the port of the future strategic objectives. These are the DPF uh, ones defined and uh, also the set of KPIs we have developed. So those are tools which are ap applicable and available to any project uh, related to the port of the future um, framework. Joris, uh, just a couple of minutes. Huh? Yeah, I'm almost finished. So the comp components and their characteristics require for successful implementation, confirmation with stakeholders, then you see the table of the, um, the scale of the EOT, uh, which is a plus two to a minus two um, scale. And that is uh, where the ports, um, both the, actually the donor port and the adapter port can look at the ease and challenges in achieving that. And it has to consider all sets of values and assess um, the internal external conditions required to achieve that. Ultimately, uh, the TA score and TA index, as mentioned, they uh, will be uh, reported to the DSS tool, but also within the Docs the Future network of excellence, we will capture the information on the Port of the Future dashboard as we move forward. So with this, I can give the floor to our next speaker from Unige, Alessio Tei. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Joris. Uh, let's uh, let's move now to uh, to the let's say the the next one that is uh, in a way combining different uh, uh, the topics uh, we we discussed already. That is a, a, an omni comprehensive let me say decision support tool. Fifteen minutes, uh, Alessio. The floor is yours. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my my screen now. Uh, uh, thank you, Yoris. Thank you, thank you, Alexia, for for, for uh, to introduce myself and, and the tool we we developed together with you all. Uh, the current presentation will be uh, connected with the decision support system. Uh, the decision support system is meant to be an easy to use tool. It's based on an Excel file, so so it should be. Uh, quite easily accessible to, to all people that wants to, to interrogate the DSS and has the, the aim of allowing decision makers to find the right measure, the right initiative suitable for achieving certain strategic goals. Uh, it's, it's meant to uh, help and ease the decision uh, making process uh, that every uh, poor stakeholder might, might be interested in. Uh, Obviously, the DSS has uh, as basic 
uh, rationale, the one, the, the, the ongoing challenges that a lot of uh, stakeholders in the port community uh, are facing. Obviously, whenever we are trying to, to invest, to think about the port of the future, we, we are actually uh, affected by uh, some conflicting interests. Uh, for instance, the long-term goals that every uh, company, every public uh, authority might have against the short-term goals and the short-term achievements that, that we need to be accounted for. Uh, obviously, we have stake different stakeholder competitions and it's really hard sometimes to, to understand which is the, prior the real priority for and, and, and the common goods, uh, as well as interconnected decision-making process. So certain decision-making processes might actually generate uh, negative impacts on the overall um, a strategy and long-term strategy uh, as well as with, with this together with these ongoing challenges obviously we have uh, certain open issues that are typical of every uh, investment process such as the multi-dimensional uh, issues and critical challenges so sometime whenever we we try to to, to make an investment of appraisal uh, we do not exactly know how to evaluate different uh, situations or how to to, 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 to deal with complexity that is going on in, in the port and, and the logistics sector overall, with all stakeholders that do have different characteristics and different strategies. Um, and, and it's really hard to communicate to the to, to, to wider community uh, the, the rationale for our uh, decision making processes. And sometimes we do have uh, really, really huge conflicts, not just because the decision making process is not right, but because it's really hard to explain why we achieve a certain kind of solution or a certain kind of decision. So uh, in this in this area, uh, we need to promote long term port development, assuring that all port stakeholders do value the decisions that, that port authorities and port community are taking and do respect and, and evaluate the reasons that, that led to a certain decision. And the DSS is trying to, to cope with all of these in a really simple and effective way. Uh, just think about uh, certain challenges that we all face uh, during these days. Uh, one of the key elements that have been also discussed previously from, from uh, other uh, speakers are, are the Green Deal related issues, so such as the deduction in terms of port emissions. And one of the key si solutions that we, now, we are now discussing is, for instance, the promotion of alternative fuels. And that should kind of be a simple kind of decision-making process. But obviously, whenever we are thinking about promoting a certain alternative fuels, we are actually promoting also conflicts on, on the community that do not exactly understand why a certain fuel should be promoted instead of another, or, or why certain strategy might be more effective than others. And we need, we need to explain this to, to our community. Uh, but, and, and these, these conflicts are actually demonstrated by relevant protests and strikes and, 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 and the NIMBY syndrome that, that we all experience. And that's, that's, that's always happened and will always happen. And this is kind of a simple situation, okay? We have the, the deduction of emission. We might have statistics that, that do, we do have advantages of switching from one fuel to another, but there are much more complicated situations. And, and, and whenever we, we think about the wider port community and the stakeholders groups, we think about conflicts, okay? You think about the mega ships and, 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 and their impact on local economy and how these might be perceived by, by other local communities. So, so we do always have conflicting issues and, and problems. So the DSS is actually think, taught to, to, to be an assistant to, to, for the promotion of, 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 of the awareness of decision-making processes, but also uh, in, in, in kind of simplify the possibility to promote uh, the, the rationale for certain decision to the wider community. Uh, in doing so is, is thinking to help to select the right initiative to, to achieve strategic objective um, uh, and, and to also be kind of customized depending on the stakeholder that one would like to, to achieve such, such kind of strategic objective, but also to support the complex decision making process and again to, to, to kind of allow multi objective action and the, the possibility to explain why we achieved certain, certain, certain goals. Uh, from from um, uh, a sim simple point of view, uh, the DSS interface has two kind of ways to 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 to, to act. Uh, the first, the basic interface, is actually uh, um, allowing the possibility 
to select the strategic objective that a certain stakeholder would like to achieve. Uh, obviously, since we are thinking about multi objective function is possible to achieve at the same time, uh, more than just one strategic objective and there will be a waiting uh, within the system that allow the, the stakeholder to have a list of measures that would, would likely achieve the, the, the strategic goal or more than one strategic goal. Within each of the measures, that is the central part of these slides, uh, clicking on one of the measure, you will find uh, in projects, so specific initiatives that dealt with that measure in achieving that set of strategic goals. And for each of the initiative or project, you will, have, at the moment, you have a description of the initiative and project and some references and, and, and an evaluation of that. Each measure is obviously, as well as uh, the, 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 the initiative are ranked in accordance with specific indexes that look at the consistencies between the measure and the strategic objective or between the initiative and the measure. So everything is, is ranked in, in order to, to allow a, an information on how to achieve those uh, um, strategic objective. Uh, kind of a dual uh, interface is actually uh, an alternative version of the DSS that is available uh, that allow the, the user to, to actually understand which kind of measures uh, can be related with specific objectives. So it's kind of a dual problem. And again, is is taught to, 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 to give more information. Uh, if we, we have an idea of the measure that we would like to, 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 to pursue, uh, which kind of objectives uh, can be actually achieved with that measure. Uh, again, since there is, there is a link between the objective and, and projects uh, or initiative, we do have also a general, um, uh, information about the project that are connected with the achievement of that specific strategic uh, objective. Uh, obviously, the DSS is a software that is based on, on, on the knowledge acquired during the, the, the doctor, Docs of the Future. Uh, experience as such is really uh, is ready to use tool, is, is available on, on Docs of the Future website and is part of the training package that I'm sure Manuela will soon uh, tell you about that. Um, and the, but the DSS might have some limitation, at least in its current version. And we will discuss a bit further about the, the, the future release of the software because we do think that the, 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 the software might have an impact in the port community in facilitating cert certain decision-making processes. First of all, uh, is the data. Obviously, it's all the data that we have collected during the project and is part of the experience of different EU projects, but, but we need to understand that, that the, uh, uh, the database and the, the, our capability, or even through other Docs of the Future initiatives, such as Network of Excellence, to collect further data will, will make the, the, the tool uh, more and more reliable and more and more useful. Uh, the, the, the first version of the DSS did not incorporate key indicators, such as the PCI and the transferability index, as, as Sonke and, and, and Yoris uh, said. Uh, and we are now working to, to release a new version that, that will incorporate these indicators once they are avail available. Um, and, and, and it's quite important to highlight that uh, its initiative, again, needs to be uh, transferred to the port or, or to the, the cost of context of the stakeholder that would like to transfer these initiative or projects. So the DSS is a decision support system, but cannot replace uh, certain ap appraisal uh, techniques such as the CBA, etc. So, so it's, it's it's always good to to, to understand it, but is it might be a part of these um, appraisal processes. Uh, in 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 the in the near future, there will be a version two available to 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 network of excellence partners and whoever would, would like to to be involved with with our experience of uh, with a new version that will include the PCI and the TA. Uh, score and indexes. Uh, there will be inter full interoperability with different systems. Uh, during the, 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 the trial of version one, some uh, we, we cooperated with, with some of, of, of external partners and we noticed there, there might be issues in, in terms of interoperability and we now have solved this issue. And obviously we will keep going on and enlarging the number of initiatives and the details of different initiatives that are considered and, and included in our database and therefore in uh, improving 
uh, always more the, the 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 quality of our DSS so to 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 be a useful tool for all the port community. Uh, I would like to thank you all and, and to thank you all the Talks to the future partners for this interesting and and, and really really uh, great collaboration together. Thanks a lot, uh, Alessio, and thanks for keeping the time. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, nice to see how the DSS is going to be further uh, evaluated and uh, developed uh, later on. So and again, the network of excellence could be the, play, the place to be next year to to show development or to see for which kind of development sports can be interested in. So let, let's go to group all of them uh, in, into the training package that we, we, we realized and that is already available. So I leave Anuela Flaki for uh, the presentation of the training package. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you, Alexia. Can you, can you see the slide? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, indeed, uh, as we said, um, uh, until now, uh, what we have, uh, that, that is, that is, uh, was also part of, it's one of the outcome of, uh, of the project, uh, and uh, is intending to stay, uh, alive also after, let's say that the official, um, end, uh, of the project and the, it's the, the, the training package that, uh, covers uh, the three tools, uh, we call it tools, that have been developed during uh, these two years and a half. Um, why we, we uh, wanted to create a training package? Uh, not only because it was, of course, a contractual obligation, but uh, um, uh, first and foremost, uh, because of uh, the um, uh, mission, let's say, the, the idea, of sharing the, the knowledge and then transferring the know-how uh, to one stakeholder to another. So transferring this know-how on what? On the uh, current state of art uh, as it is right now, on the concept of the port of the future, uh, and looking forward uh, to 2000, looking uh, towards 2030, and uh, the impact on, uh, on the future for the European port and, and port cities. Um, we, um, um, as an overall, so we address uh, the main theme of the Port of the Future concept uh, on two different levels, uh, on the conceptual, main conceptual lines and also on the technical uh, uh, details and definitions of, of uh, the meaning, let's say, of uh, Port of the Future. What, what, is, what does it stand for? What does it mean? The audience, it's, uh, it's um, diversified. It's addressed uh, to port uh, workers, so to operators, to uh, city or port city authorities, uh, to stakeholders like you um, uh, participating in, in projects uh, and um, uh, specifically cluster projects like for instance the RIAS that we had this morning, uh, this morning uh, in the early afternoon and uh, knowledge centers and, and policy makers. Um, the trainings are, uh, the, so the package are divided in three uh, different uh, online courses and they are available um, on the website, on the Docs to Future uh, website. And um, you can uh, simply uh, click on one of the three or the, the, the three of them uh, separately there is not uh, an order, so it really depends on your needs and uh, on your interests. And it's an, a very easy um, way to, to access. Here, perhaps it's a little bit small, but it's just to tell you that, uh, uh, of course, this is free uh, to everybody. You just need to uh, log in, uh, so to, um, to have your account. Uh, in this way, we also know who you are and what your, uh, where your interest lies. And um, uh, it's divided, uh, it will give you a brief explanation of what the, the course will, uh, will be about and uh, how, how it is divided in different, uh, in different modules, in different uh, lessons. Um, the training package for us is important uh, because uh, yes, it is one of the outcome of, um, of the project as such, but it's also, because it is a, is a service 
Um, that's the, the future, uh, the current actually network of excellence, the NOAA will, uh, will provide to uh, all uh, ports and all stakeholders um, um, uh, who are uh, became members of the, of the network of excellence. And that's, uh, that's an, an important uh, aspect because it gives you, it gives um, a direct connection uh, to uh, what we have, uh, what we uh, developed in terms of knowledge uh, within uh, the, the, the consortium, let's say, of the, of the future, and um, uh, transferring to uh, um, external stakeholders and helping uh, boosting their, uh, uh, let's say, their knowledge and, uh, uh, of course, uh, with an impact, a positive impact on their uh, on their expertise. Um, that's all from me. So I try to keep it in brief. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, the training package is available. Uh, it's published and uh, public and available on the website. And uh, uh, you can access uh, to the three different uh, modules uh, for free. So this is, um, um, let's say, um, uh, already already uh, 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 available and prepared for for you, um, and um, that's it for me. So Alexa, you can uh, you can take it back. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Manuela, and thanks for uh, keeping short. Uh, it is important to highlight that the the training package is grouping the some of our outcomes in in a way that could be uh, reusable and exploited later. So I think it's useful to know and please go to our website and try to use it and or spread it because this is the intention they have been bid for. Uh, we have now the session uh, the, the, on the network of excellence. We, we are now there. As I told you before, we have already 17 ports joining the network of excellence. We started early next, this year to, to discuss with them. Uh, it was bilateral discussion one by one, video conferences, of course. Uh, we were, uh, our intention was a little bit different. We wanted to have uh, some events, physical events already in, the, in, the, in 2020. It, there was an event already planned to be in parallel to the 20 days in, in Croatia, but uh, nothing came. And then, okay, we, we, we continue to, 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 to have members joining and specifically we had uh, an event uh, in present launching the network at the end of October during a, a series of events that we organized and also some internal meetings with some ports already done. And we have some very good uh, plan for 2021. But what we wanted today is to have some, some ports, uh, a couple of ports that joined the network to explain the way in which they are um, looking to the 2030 vision for the for their ports of the future, the port of Valencia and the port of uh, Le Joyce. So we stay in the Iberian Peninsula for that, but we have also others, of course. And we uh, we have also some two more presentations in terms of uh, future exploitation strategies from one of our partners, uh, Peter Brasser's uh, port expertise, and then. A, a new member, let's say, of the network, another network that is uh, teaming up with us, that's uh, Association Internationale Ville de Port and Jose Sanchez. So first, uh, I have the pleasure to, to have with us Eva Perez from Fundación Valencia Port. But Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexia. In fact, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank the organizers for inviting us to this event and for uh, sharing with us uh, the results of this project that you are presenting today. So uh, over the next 10 minutes, we would like to share with you the experience of Valencia Board Cluster in innovation projects. And we are going to give you some examples of collaboration projects that we have participated in and that um, in our opinion have been very successful. So first of all, um, please allow me to, to tell you who we are. Uh, it's going to be a very brief presentation. After that, I'll give you two examples of finalized projects that we consider have been a success. We'll talk about ongoing collaborations. And finally, uh, some thoughts about the future of the network. 
So um, who is Fundación Valencia Port? We are an applied uh, research, innovation and training center serving the port logistics cluster of uh, the Port of Valencia. Uh, we were created in 2004 as an initiative of the Port Authority of Valencia that brought together uh, many of the companies in our port cluster, as well as the universities and uh, regional institutions. Uh, since uh, our creation, we have participated in more than 200 projects and we are active in over 60 countries. The knowledge areas in which uh, we develop projects are the ones that you can see in this slide. There are two uh, very prominent um, um, areas that are digital transformation and sustainability. But we are also very active in port mar uh, maritime market uh, studies, port planning and management, port logistics, safety and security, and integration between the port and the city. Some examples of uh, projects that we have developed in collaboration with uh, many other ports and uh, companies that work uh, in collaboration with uh, port clusters. So I have selected um, this uh, example on retrofitting of port equipment and vessels to cleaner fuels and energy. As you can see in this slide, we started collaborating in studies already in 2009, and we started developing pilots in real life operations in 2013. The first projects were green cranes, sea terminals, in which we collaborated actively with the ports of Luca Copper and uh, Livorno. Then we continued working on the use of LNG um, for shipping and also how we needed to adapt our infrastructures to provide LNG bunkering services in the gain uh, for most and gain for ship innovation projects. We are also a member of Core LNG as Hive, that is where the strategy for the implementation of LNG in the uh, Iberian Peninsula has been uh, defined. And these projects have, uh, has led us to uh, um, coordinate these H2 ports that I'll uh, talk briefly about. Nowadays, we are already um, deploying um, LNG uh, both retrofitting uh, fleet of vessels and also adapting all the LNG regasification plants in Spain, as well as building LNG bunkering facilities in several ports and logistic corridors. So talking about ongoing collaborations, um, in the field of sus uh, sustainability, we are coordinating this project, Green Sea Ports, in which we are measuring real-time emissions. We are collaborating with the ports of Pireus, Venice, and uh, Bremerhaven and Wilhelmshaven. Mm -hmm. And um, we are connecting all the systems in the port to a new uh, port environmental platform. This platform is also reading um, a new sensor network that we are installing as part of this project. And with um, this, um, this platform, we can apply business intelligence, big data analysis, and artificial intelligence predictive modeling to six case studies. Um, dealing, uh, well, having as a goal, decreasing port traffic congestion, improving uh, maritime accessibility, improving air quality, reducing noise, forecasting ship to shore crane productivity, and measuring real time emissions in a door to door transport chain. So we are doing this in collaboration, which means that we can share uh, the investment, we can divide the investment needed among uh, the four ports that are participating in this um, project, and we share results. So um, if uh, all the technologies that we are implementing are successful, the four ports can benefit from this result and can um, progress with implementation of these technologies at a large scale. So um, talking about retrofitting of port equipment, uh, we started with different pilots uh, in 2013. We've been collaborating with leading manufacturers of uh, port equipment like Heister Yale, uh, Terberg, Kalmar, Con Cranes, um, ABB, and uh, many others. We have uh, developed equipment that is fueled by LNG, uh, by electricity, hybrid equipment, and today we are coordinating um, this project, H2 Ports, that is implementing fuel cells and hydrogen technologies in ports. Uh, we have developed a hydrogen fueled rich stacker that will be operating for 5,000 hours in real life operations in MSC container terminal. 
and a, a hydrogen fueled jet tractor that will be operated for 5,000 hours in Valencia Terminal Europa. And in order to uh, provide refueling uh, services, we will also operate a mobile uh, hydrogen refueling station that will be um, giving these refueling services to both uh, equipments. And again, we are doing this in collaboration with, um, uh, with many other companies in all over Europe, among which uh, Grimaldi, MSC, Heister Yale, Ballard, and, and uh, other companies. Together with companies in the network of excellence of, uh, of Doc the Future, we are, um, we are participating in this project, Ealing, uh, the European flagship action for cold ironing imports. The ultimate goal is accelerating the effective deployment of onshore power supply solutions in EU maritime ports. And in order to do so, we are going to develop a common harmonized and interoperable framework. We are going to make sure that uh, there is port to vessel compatibility in the TNT maritime network for vessels that are calling the ports that are part of this consortium that as you'll see later, it's quite broad. And uh, we are also developing technical, financial, legal, and environmental studies to be ready to launch cold ironing and, um, and also deploy the necessary electric infra infrastructure and equipment in ports. This consortium is quite uh, wide. As I said before, there are 12 TNT port authorities, uh, the ones that you can see in this slide, three, four, uh, three port and maritime public institutions, and several uh, technical and consulting companies. And well, the goal of this project is very relevant um, to many of the results that you've been discussing this afternoon, uh, as we've been able to see. Concerning digitalizations in the field of smart ports, there are several technologies um, that we would like to, to try and see how we can implement them in our ports. And I'm only going to give you two examples of uh, projects that we are developing in collaboration with uh, other uh, port authorities and other container terminals. The first one is iTerminal, where we are developing a digital platform for terminals 4.0. We are collaborating with Kone Cranes, with Kalmar, Heister, Cargotech, uh, PMC, and other uh, manufacturers. But we are also collaborating with large container terminal groups like Terminal Link, PSA, um, and uh, Bolloré. And the benefits of this platform that is developed together with uh, all these companies is to improve uh, operational efficiency, safety, uh, sustainability and maintenance by linking all the different uh, types of equipment and from all the different brands uh, in a container terminal to, uh, to an operational uh, um, platform that will be able to read all the signals, uh, no matter the brand or the type of equipment, and therefore will have a complete vision of all the operations in, in the port. At the, at the uh, present uh, time, the problem is that they all talk different languages, if we can simplify it that way. And as a result, it is uh, quite difficult, it's a matter of interoperability, it's quite difficult for a terminal operating system to actually gather in real time all these signals from all the different equipment. And we are also collaborating um, in this project, iRail, um, that will enhance rail interoperability using TFA, TSA, um, TSI standards. Um, there are two goals for this project, um, digitalizing rail freight transport uh, using these TFA, uh, TSI standards that are uh, defined in, in the interoperability directive and also improving safety, um, digitalizing safety management systems that are part of the safety directive. We are doing so in collaboration with uh, the rail uh, transport community of uh, three countries, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. And there are all, also several ports um, that are participating in this project in order to improve interoperability of rail transport services between the port and the hinterland. By having this network of collaboration, what we see is that um, we can uh, divide uh, 
among us the investment that is required to test all these technologies and to carry out all these pilots that give us information before we can actually invest in the real large scale project. We can also share um, the expertise provided by all our combined qualified personnel and we can tackle together challenges dealing with cybersecurity, other technological challenges, the potential social uh, rejection of the technologies that we are piloting in, in our projects. And by doing this, uh, we can uh, also tackle change management uh, in a much better way. So just uh, one thought um, to, to finish with my presentation about the future of the network. Our experience so far has been very positive in all these uh, collaborative projects, and we think it could be only the tip of the iceberg. So we are uh, looking forward to more projects in collaboration with you and um, to dealing with all these challenges that we have ahead of us uh, together. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm available for questions and for the discussion after the next presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eva, and thanks for your uh, very impressive uh, presentation with a really uh, a huge number of projects uh, you are uh, working in. And, uh, and thanks for joining the network. And sure, we, 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 we are already cooperating in, in some of the projects you mentioned and others will, will come. Thanks really for, for being here. And now, uh, another lady, Sara Marques, the Port Authority of uh, Le Joyce. Uh, in Porto, Portugal. So, Sara, the floor is yours. Hi, Alexio. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, so, welcome to the Port of Leixões. Uh, not so much as I'm working from home, but um, I'd like to share with you our presentation today and have you, if you can see it. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm happy to present to you the, the Port Authority of Douro Leixões and Viana do Castelo. We manage uh, Leixões and Viana ports, maritime ports and Douro's inland waterway. Uh, so we are a port cluster that uh, in the whole, we uh, are responsible for 20 million tons moved uh, for 685,000 TEOs. Uh, we have ocean 2,775 ocean ship calls, uh, including cruise ships. And we are responsible for um, a very sizable uh, amount of the, the North region GDP, for the national GDP, for employment. So we have a, a major um, social and economic importance in the areas we manage. So briefly, just to present to you uh, Le Change, uh, port, we are a multi-purpose port. So we deal with containers, with the uh, oil terminals, with offshore oil terminals, with cruises, with Roro, with agribolts. We have marinas, we have solid bulk, we have a fishing port. So we have a lot of, uh, of issues, a lot of env environmental issues. We have a lot of, uh, we have a large uh, stakeholders, uh, to, to manage and to and to uh, address. Um, we also have a port facility at Viana do Castelo uh, that comprises a commercial port and an industrial port. Uh, in the industrial port, we are happy to, to house uh, some, uh, some industries like Enercom, uh, which is a wind turbine uh, manufacturer. So we are hoping to have some very nice synergies uh, regarding uh, environmental clean uh, energy sources. Uh, we have a very important shipyard uh, also in the, in the industrial port. And we are now developing uh, some investments in order to allow the shipyard to grow and to, and to provide some more employment to a rather depressed um, economic area. So the port has a major impact uh, in the area, in the region. And we also have the recreational port at Viana do Castelo. Douro's Inland Waterway. Uh, if you don't know it, you should come and know it sometime when the future allows. Uh, so we manage, it's a 208 kilometer long inland waterway. It's the only inland waterway uh, so far in Portugal. Uh, we have been lucky enough to be able to develop it uh, in some aspects, uh, mainly in the information systems. 
because today we have uh, more than one million passengers and one million tourists um, uh, in the in the river, and also we are we are hoping to manage some uh, some more cargo coming from the the ore mines, the iron ore mines in Moncorvo. So we have uh, many uses for this inland waterway. The inland waterway also has five locks. They are they are from the 70s and 80s, from last century. So the, the inland waterway is a challenge for us because we were used to manage uh, maritime ports, uh, and now we have this beautiful ch challenge to manage also. So what we do today? Today we find, we think of ourselves as um, a very progressive port. We we are we are some. We manage small units uh, in the with many social issues, and because we manage uh, ports that are enclosed in the city, uh, and we need to make them as um, efficient as possible. So we rely on technology, and we rely on information to help us do that. So today we have for the ports in the inland waterway, we have um, the port single gate, we have port community systems, we have port single window, we have river information services. So we have a lot of uh, tools to help us. Namely in the ports, we have a, uh, for many years now a port single window, which is an electronic platform that uh, that is a virtual one-stop shop. So in this only a platform, the, 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 um, the relevant uh, economic agents can share and can input their information only once. So they don't have to, so customs can check that information, uh, sanitary control can check that information, uh, freight force can check that information. The Port Authority hosts and manage this uh, platform uh, and services um, and all the public institutions and private uh, stakeholders can uh, can uh, input and retrieve information from this platform uh, uh, with only one one input. We also have a port single gate and we we, uh, we have improved its efficiency uh, in order to make uh, to manage the, the waiting time at the gate for 11 minutes and the time at the port to a minimum. Uh, also, with the, the new uh, with a new app uh, directed to truckers, uh, truckers can check the status of their cargo, and also so they can they can avoid at going to the port and waiting for a long time. So, so this is very important also for the the traffic in the area, for the environment in the area. The truckers can go to the port only when they know their cargo will be available for for deposit or or withdrawal. Uh, in the river, we have been um, also implementing for the last two years uh, uh, the river information services, uh, which are very tricky. The Douro River is a, a very winding river. Uh, in some places, we don't even even have a cell phone uh, signal. So we need to implement we need to implement the, the, the information services all along the river, and we did it with a, with a co-funding from the European Union from the Connecting Europe facility. Uh, so now we have uh, um, a Doros Inland Waterway portal uh, that can be accessed by public in general, by uh, river operators. And we have the, the ferry information service, traffic information uh, up to date, weather conditions. Uh, also, uh, there are some informations that can be uh, partain with the authorities in case of emergency. We have the emergency plan, we have the nautical charts. So all the information is available there to, 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 to be used. Uh, so now future challenges. So the future challenges for all the, our port cluster is uh, obviously everything that has to do with uh, sustainability. And sustainability and innovation are our main drivers for the future. And it's also why we were very eager to join the Network of Excellence of uh, the Docs of Future project because um, now we, we are we are dealing in um, in energy projects. So we need to know if we can be self-sufficient in terms of energy. We are we are uh, we had some uh, some in interesting projects with uh, with the universities, namely for instance Airship that evaluates the impact the impact. Of the maritime and port um, activities uh, in the air quality, which is very important for us as we sit, as I said, in the middle of the city. Uh, we are in some uh, 
uh, projects regarding uh, the automation inspection and maintenance of, of uh, ship hulls and also in digitalization uh, we have some uh, we are some, uh, developing some interesting projects uh, namely the, the, um, the evolution of a port digital twin for a PDL that is starting for now it, with the um, the, the three maps track, which allows for tracking the potentially dangerous uh, uh, goods movement in the port of Lechon specifically. We have a Jeep project, uh, which is a project for uh, a predictive model to develop a, a predictive model for the, the need for maintenance in the, the port infrastructures. So we are doing that also with, uh, with um, software houses and, and the university and an automated vessel monitoring project PMIs. So what we expect from this network of excellence, uh, we, we hope to share some knowledge, to get some knowledge and uh, to have some innovative ideas to help us be the most efficient and the most neutral we can be. And um, also to support some policy changes uh, from the point of view of the ports and its stakeholders. And so we can be the best we can be. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot, Sara. Yeah, I am. <laughs> thanks for the presentation. As you see, we have so um, many interesting ports into the network. Also, the others that are with us, they have a lot of uh, innovative stuff already in it, and they are eager to, to, to find other kind of innovations also using the network of excellence. And that, that is why we need to, to have a, a call for action to exploit the, the possibilities uh, of the network. That is why also uh, for port collaboration, network of excellent membership and some consideration about how to exploit the best out of it, I leave the floor to uh, Peter uh, Bresselers, that uh, uh, is the director of Port Expertise, one of the partner in our uh, consortium. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours for 10 minutes, please. Thank you. It won't take so long, uh, Alexio. Is it uh, all visible, I think? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so my name is indeed uh, Peter Bresslers, managing partner of Port Expertise, and Port Expertise is a partner of this nice Docs to Future project. Now, it is with pleasure to see you all participating in this virtual closing event of Docs to Future. The preparation of this project already started early 2017, and since then, a lot changed. The last months, it became clear that collaboration has become a very much needed resource in societies, and this becomes more apparent every day. Many challenges, though, still lie ahead of us. Also in our sector, where the legislation pipeline is fully focused on making our logistics sustainable and digitalized. To name but a few, we have the FT regulation makes it obligatory for the relevant public authorities to accept digital information when made available by stakeholders in the industry. As a preparation by the summer of 2021, all EU member states have to submit a list of the regulatory information requirements in their national legislation within the scope of this FT regulation, and this for all transport modes, including air. National maritime single windows, all maritime single windows have reported their own, I mean, all member states have reported their own national data sets to DG Move, and the data element harmonization process is currently ongoing to have a national maritime single window ready by 2024 and uh, 25. The near future implementation of the sulfur emission control area in the Mediterranean Sea, it's also a topic. New regulations will be there on waste reporting and passenger registration. We also have the further implementation on the Directive of the Harmonized River Information Services, which will enter into a next phase by connecting to the other transport modes. Now, just to give you an idea, there are over 2 million European port calls per year. Now, for the basic data to be reported for a ship's port call, which is called the FAL messages, this involves 560 million data elements and 4.6 million working hours to enter and sadly enough, re-enter this data over and over again. Now this data only concerns the port calls aspect of the maritime lake of the full supply chain. Imagine now the data to be added for the other transport modes and the final parcel to get it delivered to your home. 
The inability to share this data over the full supply chain is a serious threat in reaching the green port ideal. Sustainability will not reach its full potential without digitalization. But luckily, you are not alone. One of, the, uh, one of the DOC's futures achievements is indeed the creation of the aforementioned network of excellence managed by all DOCs, the future project partners, ISL, Circle, Genoa University, Maglan, and Port Expertise. This network of excellence is indeed a community supporting your organization to develop innovative projects to achieve sustainable targets aligned with European programs set forth, such as the Green Deal, as shown in the video at the beginning. Now, the Network of Excellence has an impressive list of members already, and today, with pride, indeed, we can announce the official joining of AIVP, as announced by the General Manager, Mr. Olivier Lemaire. AIVP is the Association, uh, Association Internationale de Ville Portuaire, so the worldwide network of Port City, that since 30 years has been bringing together all the public and private development stakeholders in Port Cities. Collaboration between ports and cities is also an ideal way to remediate the frictions between port activities and their cities. One cannot do without the other. And AFAP assists ports and cities, and in that way also the network of excellence on these topics and this on a global share scale. Now, this is all to tell you that we actually miss you. You are invited to join this network of excellence by signing up and start working together. More information is available at the website of Docs the Future. My name is Peter Bresles, partner of Port Expertise. Thank you, and I wish you a happy continuation of this fine event. See you soon. Thanks, Alex. Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, and um, it, it is worthwhile to say that um, how you could join, a port could join the network of excellence. This is important to say. Uh, we have uh, established, uh, let's say, a letter of commitment that, that is a letter of commitment of the port to achieve the Green Deal objectives. So the, uh, in joining the network, the port is committing uh, itself and the community to reach the, um, to achieve the Green Deal uh, objectives. And then we, we ask for the availability of some experts within the port to work in specific domain that could be part of future projects that the network will establish uh, together. So this is, and the network is for free. So there is, it, this is not an association. Mm -hmm. It's not intended to be an association. It is not in, uh, in competition with the association. Quite on the contrary, uh, it's going to work as a, as a think tank, uh, as, a, as, a, you know, as a parallel uh, group of experts to support uh, other associations that are working within ports, such as the technological platforms, Alice, that was here today, or Waterborne, that is also important. So uh, that is to say that we are also looking to uh, other kind of partnership and with other networks. And uh, quite important, another network joined uh, as an, the, the, the network of excellence, that is the network of the cities working with, with ports, and it is international cities worldwide, it's not only European. So uh, we, we had a very fruitful cooperation with AIVP during uh, the last uh, three years, uh, working on a specific topic that was uh, highlighted from, as, a, as important uh, from the commission, uh, that is uh, the port city relation. And so that, that's our pleasure also to have, uh, let's say, a word, a speech by Jose Sanchez, uh, that is the secretary general of this uh, association. Uh, the Association uh, of uh, Port City. Thanks, uh, the, the, the floor is yours, Jose. Uh, well, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting us. I know it was a, a, a last minute to try to, to find the space, and I apologize, I apologize if I took time from any of my, of my colleagues, uh, but it is really a pleasure to be back uh, uh, working with the team of Docs of Future. And uh, very thankful for the previous presentation. Very kind from you. Uh, now I move forward to, to my presentation. Well, um, I know it's already light, uh, late in the day, so I will uh, try to make it short and uh, go a bit uh, fast uh, to leave a later time to the final panel that has very known experts that will, will be able to explore some, some, tip, some topics in a certain depth. Um, before jumping into the AVP Agenda 2030, which is really the key topic of the, of the presentation, I wanted to remind us 
a little bit of what is it, uh, what what happens, what is what we, uh, what is the the port city and the port relationship. So I always like to start with this definition by Professor uh, Carola Hein, uh, that usually also works for with us in in our network of experts and. She defines the port city as the spatial embodiment of global economic flows between sea and land. And in them, we can read the effects of network of trade and transport. So usually I would show you a nice image of the maritime flows and the fixities of the cities, but to speed up in the end is really about talking, uh, it's really talking about this uh, sometimes difficult interaction that can happen between the global flows that are the, the maritime elements of supply chains. And then again, also the fixities, so the places where we uh, live, where we work, uh, where we spend our, our free time and so on. And this, of course, is always uh, challenging. It's always challenging because uh, we have seen that uh, port activities entail certain ex externalities, particularly in the uh, local context. Um, we, and especially also because they have affected significantly the perception of these port activities by the local population. Here, of course, uh, we are the very well known environmental issues, uh, potential labor conflicts, traffic, and the regulations that stop citizens to coming closer to the water are all well known uh, issues. And these, of course, uh, generate tensions, port city tensions, or tensions that exist in this uh, relationship. Uh, it's they are sometimes almost inevitable because uh, they are complex. Port cities are complex, ports themselves are complex, cities in themselves are also complex. And in this complexity, we find a great diversity of urban and port actors that very often have different priorities and, and ambitions, and they very often compete for a very desirable space that is the, the urban waterfront. And as some colleague was saying in another webinar some days ago, ports actually have to be close to the water to function. So of course, it's not simply that can be moved uh, to another location and continue functioning. Um, of course, there are all the environmental, social, economic concerns that I was saying, they are very often territorial uh, tensions because, uh, as we know, particularly in certain um, countries where there is this uh, uh, local or regional competition or diversity of opinion between the national um, power, the national state and the local municipality. And we also see this uh, with historical issues. I mean, important cities have existed that they are like the um, story of the chicken and the egg. So what came first? Uh, so they have been constantly growing uh, together and overlapping each other. And of course it has created a certain history of exchanges. And additionally, we have the uh, different uh, laws, although in Europe we are streaming, we are going uh, towards a certain uh, uniformity uh, of, of the legal framework, but still we have very, very big differences between our countries. And of course this scales up when we go to uh, a global scale. And of course, there is the underlying issue of uh, the port city relationship, which is the fact that they are national and uh, we could say broader uh, benefits of these port activities are spread hundreds of kilometers away, but uh, the externalities still remain within the local boundaries. So of course, this generates a certain uh, uh, we could say an even uh, relationship. And this is something that was already highlighted, not just by, by myself in this presentation, but by many academics before. So trying to work on, on this tension, this where we, where, where we operate. So AVP uh, has already been very uh, kindly presented by Peter and Alessio and, and earlier by, by Yoris. So we do operate, we're an association and we do operate in a global scale with a goal of improving the port city interaction and making it uh, more sustainable. Um, I don't have to say much more than what they said before. A uh, big part of our members are uh, still in Europe. Our net, our home office or base office is in, in Europe, is in Le Havre, in France. And what we also see is that Euro has a certain capacity, but also responsibility to lead uh, the quest for sustainable port city relationship and for sustainable ports. Uh, we see that the knowledge that is produced in Europe and the initiatives that are produced in Europe, they are later, uh, I wouldn't say copied, but uh, definitely they inspire action in many different locations worldwide. And there are many other countries that may not have this capacity to, uh, uh, to, to do this kind of research or this kind of innovation, 
that they still can benefit uh, partly, I think, uh, to thanks to the work that we do in try to spread this, this useful knowledge. And it is also fair to acknowledge the evolution of the development priorities of, of ports. And this is something that is, is very visible uh, in, in different documents, in the academia, in uh, the master plan of different ports. Uh, fortunately, we see that there is a, an evolution from the economic performance focus towards environmental and also social performance. So gradually uh, including more values in the, um, in the, in the port development uh, strategy. And it's inter interesting because as another colleague, colleague was saying uh, not long ago, it is an evolution from an economic or logistic hub towards a local and regional value hub. So in a way, uh, making efforts to balance this relationship that we were saying before, uh, it remains in balance in certain aspects. And in this context is where we created the AVP Agenda 2030 uh, um, that I already introduced in, in one workshop uh, in Trieste uh, in, uh, in the framework of the uh, Docs of Future uh, project. Um, we, uh, I presented the first almost draft version. We have created a platform and basically what we wanted to do, what we want to do, uh, uh, what we do with this uh, idea, with this initiative of the AVP Agenda 2030 is to adapt the 17 sustainable uh, development goals and uh, indicators that are behind this global initiative by the UN uh, towards uh, in, into the port city context, the port city relationship. And the idea is to uh, foster action by the key actors operating in this interaction, uh, particularly in these 10 key areas that we have identified as the crucial fields in which uh, they, should, uh, ask, they should act um, in order to contribute to a port, sustainable port city relationship and by extension to the global sustainable uh, development. And this is already something that uh, Yoris uh, included before. And of course, it reflects several key ideas that have been, or key themes that have been already commented uh, earlier in this, in this webinar, such as the issues of energy transition and circular economy or the issue of mobility. But they include also other issues that are very often um, I wouldn't say neglected, but do not get the spotlight as much, and they are hardly quantifiable. And this is the real challenge, as I will uh, insist uh, at the end. So how do we assess uh, the governance of the port city interaction of ports? How, can it, how do we assess the transparency? How do we assess the disclosure of port culture and identity? So there are challenges that um, we will need to, to address, and it's motivated also for the cooperation. Now, these 10 key points, uh, establish a, a relationship with the different SDGs through the concrete actions. As we don't have the time now to go in a lot of detail, but I can tell that uh, each one of the goals um, has then specific uh, actions in order to clarify what are the um, project or initiatives that port city um, actors could develop. We can also say that since we presented it, and this is a bit an evolution since our uh, last meeting, uh, more than 19 signatories worldwide have already expressed their public support uh, to these uh, to this document, uh, signing, rati officially ratifying it, and uh, some major ports in Europe, but also from uh, around the world, and also um, cities, several uh, several port cities that are aware of the importance of the port and the importance of port activities, but also are stressed their their concerns towards uh, finding a certain uh, balance uh, with the port. Now, just to, to conclude, because I, I don't want to take too much time from the uh, later uh, closing session. So what is the road ahead and what have, be, uh, what have we been doing and what do we want to do, to do? So of course, we want to continue guiding ports and cities towards sustainable interaction based on these 10 goals. And this response to our core mission, as I was saying uh, at the beginning, and we will use these 10 goals as our uh, uh, red thread guiding us uh, towards the future, particularly, of course, uh, to towards 2030, as uh, the name itself expresses. Another thing that we want to do and that we are doing is uh, call for attention of global institutions to port city issues and to the relationship between port and cities, as we believe that um, they are beacons of sustainable development and they required uh, a, a coordinated action between global and local players. We have already signed an MOU with UN Habitat and we presented the agenda in the last uh, World Urban Forum to get the attention towards port city issues. 
And we are also starting to cooperate with other global institutions. Just a few, for example, just a few weeks ago, we had um, a webinar with uh, the deputy director of the World Heritage Center of UNESCO in order to see what, uh, to discuss what is the role that port actors may play in the preservation of uh, port city heritage uh, and maritime heritage. It's very often falls under its, um, it's the, the area that is controlled by the port and it entails a sense of responsibility. And it's far away from the usual concerns by port authorities uh, related to traffic or even to energy, uh, to energy issues. Now, what we want to do and continue a bit also the work that we have been doing so far is uh, sharing uh, good practices and good examples from uh, our network, but also outside our network. Um, and what we are doing is structuring this uh, knowledge into these 10 goals and is in fact what we are doing now, uh, focusing our content uh, each month in one of these particular goals and at the end producing a thematic dossier, uh, gathering this, uh, this knowledge and counting of course with a, a collaboration of, of different experts and of course hosting a webinar since as you know, uh, as we are seeing today, it's not possible to physically uh, meet. And um, of course, we're also developing uh, new corporations in order to have new knowledge and new tools. Uh, we have worked with uh, Docs the Future uh, quite uh, fruitfully in the past couple of years, and uh, we expect to continue so. We are uh, also just recently started a cooperation with, um, with Pixel Ports, another uh, product that was presented today. And uh, for example, just in a few days, just this week, we will have another uh, webinar in cooperation with another European project in order to discuss sustainable port city mobility involving the ports of uh, Antwerp and uh, Trieste. And uh, now coming a bit more to, to the end, I think there's two key ideas that I would like to leave and, and uh, uh, launch in the air. One is that uh, it would be interesting to consider as well urban actors as valid partners for sustainable development and to address the issues that are very often concerned in ports. We have seen it uh, in some European projects, but I think the cooperation can go much further. And uh, uh, of course, we offer ourselves to try to breach between these two uh, sets of actors and these two uh, realities that need to cooperate. And I think there is also a challenge and it's a bit what is also leading us uh, and motivating us to to establish new partnerships and new corporations and also uh, to join the uh, uh, network of excellence that is, has been announced uh, several times today is, so what are then the key ways to assess sustainable port city relationship? Uh, we want to develop a particular tool in order to facilitate um, the, this assessment to, to our members. Uh, but as I said before, it is not quite e so easy when we start to take into consideration other values or other dimensions that uh, may not be so easily uh, quantifiable. So it's perhaps uh, necessary to develop new KPI, uh, KPIs that can express these unquantifiable dimensions in a more uh, clear way, or is perhaps um, a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods in order to arrive to a certain conclusion or a certain tool that can uh, help ports and cities to assess how they are contributing to uh, sustainable port city relationships. So uh, with that uh, question, that challenge, um, I, I conclude my, my presentation expressing again that we are thrilled to join the Network of Excellence, uh, that we have very clear ideas of uh, what we need to, to, to do or the fields that we need to, to work together. And I extend the invitation to uh, next uh, Thursday when we will discuss uh, sustainable mobility in port cities. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, um, Jose. By the way, we we invited also the Civitas Portis project in one uh, also of the our previous uh, e events. And uh, thanks for the presentation. I think you you touched a couple of points that I have clearly in mind. One is about govern the go governance, and uh, the issue of the governance is uh, in between uh, the port and the cities is a, is a, is a quite uh, is a quite a topic that uh, for whoever as me, uh, live in a, in a port city, uh, you see every day in many different mm. aspects. So it's still, it's still a, a very important issue. And I think uh, most probably the, the green port call 
uh, that includes a master plan and governance part that uh, is going also to give some uh, uh, possible future answers, uh, evo evo evoluted answers, I may say. And last but not least, thanks for the first image uh, you show, <laughs> because if I'm not wrong, this is my city. This was Genoa, the city, the, the picture you show at the, at the well, beginning. Well, I, I, I hate to, cor to correct you, Alexia, but it's actually my city is Lisbon. But I, it's not but, it's not because it's very very similar. Eh? It's very similar, but um, I cheated because I mirrored it to fit better the screen. So I will send you the original image so you can see better in which part of Lisbon is it. Okay, okay, okay. Because it seems really and uh, it's it's really really quite similar in uh, yeah. um, taken from the port. But okay, that's <laughs> that's nice. I by the way, I really love Lisbon <laughs> as my city. So we are perfectly in time. Only a couple of minutes late, uh, fantastic. Uh, it was really brilliant uh, the way in which all the speakers managed their time. We have the time for the last uh, round table that is dedicated to a very specific topic. Uh, as Port City, as many other topics, there was one indication from the Commission at the beginning to focus uh, on uh, the relation with neighboring countries. And for a number of reasons, we decided to uh, focus a little bit more these neighboring countries in the in the Mediterranean area. Uh, the Met uh, Sea is certainly a sea in which the uh, neighboring countries aspects are, are definitely crucial. Um, most of the um, routes are crossing the, the, the Met north, south and east, west, connecting EU countries with non-EU countries with a lot of uh, issues. And that is why we, we had also a, a specific uh, analysis that will be part of the roadmap dedicated to the uh, MAD countries. And that, that is also why we dedicated one of, of the meeting of our independent consultative committee about that. And one of the experts of this uh, independent consultative committee is together with us, together with other two, is Professor Michele Acciaro from the Kuhn University. So thanks for, for joining us. And we have also Edward Rhodes, that is the director of the uh, Scuola Europea for Sorti Shipping, that uh, based in Barcelona, so quite uh, uh, an expert to, to give some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, answers about uh, the, the, the issue of neighboring countries and, uh, and the ports of the future there. And last but not least, we have also Leonardo Manzari, that is representing the WestMet uh, technical assistance mechanism for, for Italy, so uh, the perspective of the of the Mediterranean Sea a little bit more from the blue growth blue economy, in which um, uh, views in which ports are anyhow uh, really really uh, important. So let's go. I have prepared a couple of questions for for you each, and then a general uh, one uh, uh, at the end. Thank you. So the first the first one uh, is exactly for you, Leonardo. Okay, is um, as you. You 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 look to the to the Met from a, a little uh, bit different perspective. That is not totally focused on the maritime transport side and the port side, but more on the uh, blue economy, blue growth uh, perspective. So, which kind of uh, let's say possible uh, cooperation and uh, you see for ports uh, bringing together you know the, the these aspects of the. Uh, of the transport, of the logistics, of the port city relation, with the, as the aspects that are related to the so-called blue economy. Uh, uh, well, um, um, thank you, first of all, uh, uh, Alessio and, uh, uh, and uh, Circle for uh, giving me the possibility to join uh, your nice event today. Uh, well, of course, uh, we are facing, uh, uh, as a WestMed initiative, which is an initiative uh, uh, um, in practice uh, um, uh, addressed to the uh, uh, five plus five dialogue countries, uh, so five uh, uh, from uh, the northern shore of the Mediterranean, so Italy, France, Portugal, Spain, and Malta, uh, and five from the southern shore, so Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Mauritania, and uh, uh, Libya, um, to, let's say, share uh, the same uh, common blue economy agenda, if possible, and uh, to give, of course, uh, common implementation, uh, uh, tackling uh, common challenges uh, in the in the Western Mediterranean sub-basin. Uh, 
of course, uh, um, such an initiative of the DigiMare European Commission is an initiative which uh, is uh, um, uh, facing uh, different uh, levels uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, um, development of uh, uh, blue economy and also maritime transport and ports uh, in the different countries. So, of course, the um, uh, I would say, first of all, uh, one important uh, precondition uh, for all these countries, uh, and which also could be interesting uh, to be brought uh, and enlarged to the whole basin, is uh, an approach in terms of uh, uh, maritime spatial planning. Uh, why? Because, of course, they are facing different uses and different destinations of the maritime space, which is somehow uh, um, affecting uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, the efficiency of uh, uh, maritime transport, but in general of all, uh, uh, of all uh, activities related to uh, the, uh, the blue economy. And this is, uh, this is one uh, element which is quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, we are inside the uh, uh, inside the, uh, le let's say our 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 initiative, we have felt immediately the need to tackle together the same uh, challenge and to create, as you know, a technical group working uh, on sustainable transport, in particular, uh, where uh, the need uh, of to to make a common effort, uh, both towards uh, the reduction of emissions and. Uh, uh, to make, uh, of course, more efficient, uh, uh, let's say the 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 whole maritime transport sector is uh, is uh, of course uh, needed uh, to work together. Thanks. Quite quite clear. And uh, let's move to uh, a topic that is uh, sustainability uh, that that we touched several times uh, today. And uh, Michele is a top expert uh, in this respect. So, uh, what's your opinion in terms of of, on, uh, of how the Mediterranean ports will, uh, let's say, proactively face the environmental challenge, moving towards sustainability, but also taking into account the different level of development in the different, uh, you know, uh, north and south uh, banks. Thanks a lot, Alessio. Also from my side, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, and thanks also for the for being defined as an expert. I, I keep on repeating the same thing for 15 years, so maybe that qualifies me as an expert. I would like to actually not be an expert and see things changing, but unfortunately, that's that's not always the case. Uh, now, apart from from jokes, I think it's it's very important to consider the Mediterranean dimension of shipping and ports. We tend very often, <coughs> sorry, very often also in Europe to. Uh, focus uh, more on the ports of the north and it seems that the sustainability agenda is decided or is relevant only for northern Europe and of course this is absolutely not the case. The Mediterranean is a very important maritime area. We have 30,000 vessels a year that transit through the Mediterranean which is about 7% of the total fleet. This is uh, uh, the basins which relates to 21 countries is almost half a million people. And so we should not neglect uh, that, that aspect. Uh, I think it's very critical to consider environmental issues. Of course, one of the issues for the Mediterranean is that it's not under a single jurisdiction. So as we all know, we have, of course, the European Union with its very ambitious uh, agenda. And then we have, of course, countries in uh, uh, in Asia or West Asia. We have uh, Turkey, which plays a very important role, both uh, in geopolitics, but as well as also economically. And of course, we have uh, countries of North Africa. And that makes, of course, a lot of the uh, discussions on environmental issues in the Mediterranean very complex. That's why it would be very important to pursue uh, agreements in first places at an international level. And there, I think the most important one is, of course, the development of an emission control area in the, in the Mediterranean. Now we have been discussing an emission control area for about 20 years now, uh, since emission controls area have been, decided, have been developed. I think there are parties to the Barcelona Convention uh, 
which is an old uh, group that brings in together all 21 uh, countries and the European Commission, the European Union, um, all, all together under one roof. And there has been now developments with the objective and a, a guideline to actually discuss a presentation of an emission control area to the MEPC uh, in the IMO, uh, in the MEPC session 78. Of course, this is only if there is a full agreement among the various countries, and I think this is problematic, but nonetheless, uh, it shows a lot of urgency. There are many studies that have shown that we would be able, with an emission control area, to save uh, 970 deaths per year from cardiovascular diseases, to save 150 deaths per year in uh, uh, reduction in lung cancer mortality, and to reduce asthma morbidity for children into 2,300 people per year. And I think that is uh, an enormous amount of, of results with costs which are estimated relatively small because we observe that, for example, for a container, an emission control area in the Mediterranean would, re would result in about a $3 uh, per container, which is not little money, but is not uh, a lot. And the cruise sector, which is said to be the one that would be the most heavily affected, would actually result in an increase in the cost, according to several studies, of about one passenger, one dollar per passenger per day, which is a manageable amount of money, I think, and would definitely worth the uh, the, uh, the, the uh, savings of life. And of course, the very important benefits that would be in the acidification reduction and the reduction in the aerosol uh, related uh, haze, which also dominates the Mediterranean. And of course, the Mediterranean is a very fragile ecosystem, uh, which needs uh, to, be, to be protected. And in that sense, I think uh, we need to, to do something in that area. There are, of course, other areas which are, which are important as well. Uh, one, of course, uh, uh, relates to the efforts at a European level, specifically with the emission, uh, with the inclusion of shipping in the emission trading scheme of, of, uh, of the European Union. And I think this poses an enormous threat to the ports, European ports in the Mediterranean. Why is it an enormous threat? Because very likely an emission trading scheme will uh, consider emissions calculated from the last port of coal. And that would give an enormous incentives for players to actually transship their cargo or touch in the North African or the Atlantic ports, non-European Atlantic ports or Turkish ports. Uh, and that could damage enormously the potential of the ports, Malta, Cyprus, of course, being important transshipment area, but also the Iberian Peninsula and Italy and the Greek ports as well. So I think that is extremely important that we consider this. And then I would expect from European, South and European ports to have a very proactive attitude towards trying to require that everything that is done at a European level is also done at a Mediterranean level. So I, I would like to see a much stronger voice from European, from uh, Southern European ports and Mediterranean, but not only of course, Portuguese ports as well, in trying to, to say, we need to have these rules uh, developed also uh, in the entire Mediterranean and not only for us. And I think this, this topic, which is clear, I think it's, it's evident, is very often not discussed enough. So that's why I welcome the, the, the requirement from the commission uh, to ask that this project also looks at the Mediterranean because the Mediterranean and Russia are actually the only two areas, and then the Black Sea, the only three areas where we have potential competition. And we don't want European ports to be at a disadvantage because they are rightly protecting the environment and, and imposing rules and regulations which are there for the benefit of the citizens. And also because I don't think that the citizens of, of Russia or the citizens of the, of the uh, Black Sea or the city of the Mediterranean deserve uh, worse air or deserve uh, uh, a dirtier Mediterranean. We are all sharing this, this resource together. And, and the last point very, very briefly is of course related to, to port taxation, which I think is a necessity if you really want ports to uh, actually uh, be able to, uh, with their resources to, to actually reduce environmental uh, environmental uh, impacts. Uh, I think in, in this area, port taxation is an area where also, of course, uh, as this will be coming and it needs to come for European ports, will impose uh, environmental taxation, will impose a disadvantage for European ports versus the ports of the Mediterranean. 
Quite clear, uh, Michele, thanks. Uh, it is exactly true what you are saying. What I think is that probably uh, we are um, facing a, a time in which uh, f a, a, there is a little bit of a last call to, uh, to, to act in this respect. Uh, and the, the, the fact that uh, there is this uh, phenomenon that is changing our society and life in, the, in this year, uh, it, it may lead to, to use, for instance, the, the next generation EU in the proper way towards these uh, 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 sustainability issues. I, we don't know. We, still, we, we, we will see next year. We will see soon, but still we, we shouldn't uh, leave the hope for, uh, for, for that because that, that's the, the way to go. And let's move to, to the subject of, um, let's say, new skills or updated skills, capacity building. So, uh, Edward, you have a lot of experience in, in training all over uh, Europe, but specifically in, uh, in the area. So um, how to proceed to really establish uh, an, an harmonized level of uh, skills and capacity, uh, for even including less developed countries in the Med region? Uh. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Alexia, for the invitation. Thank you, Professor. Well, the question is that uh, we have a lot to do in the north, let's say. It's not clear that the needs are in the south. Uh, one of the main problems is that uh, everything is changing. Uh, I, I like to say that we are in a world in transition. We are, in fact, in my point of view, changing the cycle. We are starting a new period of time. COVID probably is uh, a turning point on that. And uh, what we have to do is to try, in my point of view, to work together to do that. We have a lot of expertise on that. We have been training students from the North and from the South. Now more with the South, with an, uh, any project, which is something, uh, is one of the elements that can help also very much to try to improve the skills in the South uh, and uh, everything that we have talked today is uh, under revision, let's say. So we have to manage the digital transition. We have to manage the energy transition and we have to manage the network transition. So the three main networks and in my point of view, I always like to say that in fact, we, what, we, what develops society is the development of the networks we are inside. So let's say the port of the future, in fact, wants to build a new network of professionals, of ports, et cetera. But this is the main point that we are trying to do. Uh, these are all in transitions. So we don't know which kind of energy we'll have to work with in the coming years. We don't know which kind of digital skills we will need for that. And when I talk about digital skills, I always like very much to say that this is something like a car. In fact, we drive cars, but we know nothing about cars. So in, in this digital, digital transition, it's not clear what kind of uh, skills we need to have. And uh, for the network, let's say that this is more clear. So we have to work much more on the concept of intermodal transport. We have to develop the connection of the networks. So it's very much also related with the Trans-European transport network connected with the Trans-Mediterranean transport network. So we have to work. And in my point of view, the European Commission has to change a little bit the efforts in this sense. If we want to connect both sides, we need to invest in the South. And uh, if we want to have a more stable area, we need to develop the South side. And this means to make the effort, because it's not easy, to do, to do this. And it's true that in the environmental issues, for example, I am very happy to hear me tell about the possibility of the Ecazon. I, I know very well that this is against the ports in the north, let's say, but this is something which is, in my point of view, very needed for the, for the world, let's say, and for the Mediterranean area. We have this works as a network. And the problem is that the vessel that leaves a port in, in uh, Rades will go to call in a port in Civitavecchia. Or, so, I mean, we'll have to manage all these elements at the same time. In my point of view, 
the challenge is that the ports are supposed to be the engine, one of the engines to change, let's say, society. We have to take the challenge that we actives in changing the what's going on, let's say. So we have to be very uh, in the very strong in digital skills, in environmental skills, sustainability, and we have to learn more to work by teams. This is not, let's say, this is what we call the soft skills. We have to develop something that can seem more easy, like the English as a lingua franca, and this is not evident. I mean, this is one of the elements that we need to, to find a solution. We need to talk the same language to develop society and uh, we have to improve also innovation and we can teach the people to how to innovate how to work in teams how to think out of the box how to solve problems and all these kinds of things and this is what we are trying to do we have we have a, we are very lucky we have an any project with five ports port communities of the north uh, valencia barcelona Marseille, Civitavecchia, and four in the south, Beirut, uh, Damieta, Acaba, and Rades, well, uh, Tunis. And uh, we are trying to build something like this with tools that today has been already explained with virtual labs, with virtual ports, like trying to build digital twins for, learn, for, learn, for training purpose trying to simulate all the operations in the port environment. And uh, in fact, we are giving the South the same tools that we are giving in the North. So let's imagine that at the end, we'll uh, achieve to have both sides with uh, same skills. So this is one of the main challenges that we are facing today. Thanks. That 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 is true. Uh, that is uh, that is not also the case of little less developed countries, but it's also to update the skills and the expert and the capacity, the capacities in the, in the north. Huh? That because uh, and the digitalization is uh, is a key example uh, on that. Uh, let's move to the second round of uh, questions, and specifically for uh, for you, Leonardo, is uh, uh, in the West Med um, assistant mechanism. Uh, you are discussing. Uh, a lot about uh, alternative, altern let's call it alternative fuels, okay, in, for, for maritime. And uh, uh, there is a discussion between northern and southern countries about how to move. And, uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the situation is not exactly similar when you have to uh, build infrastructure, change vessels, and so on. Uh, which are the main, uh, let's say, uh, trends, uh, which are the main projects that could um, come out of... Uh, of this, uh, let's say, uh, sustainable transport and green shipping group within the WestMed mechanism? Uh, well, um, uh, thank you, Alessio. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, let's say we have uh, started doing a kind of synthesis among the very different, uh, 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 let's say, priorities uh, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, let's say, targets of uh, the different countries. Uh, and I would say that one uh, of the main uh, uh, topic was exactly what was mentioned also by Michele and uh, Edward, the harmonization also of the context in which we, of course, uh, try to operate. Uh, but also, of course, it's important, uh, uh, let's say, to uh, ensure these uh, projects uh, also uh, um, important to access uh, uh, to finance the to finance the programs of the European Union, which is not quite often for the southern uh, uh, for the southern countries, uh, and this is a, 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 a topic which is limiting a lot uh, our achievements uh, from many points of view. But of course, uh, we uh, uh, let's say felt uh, the uh, uh, and we uh, let's say. Um, um, concentrated on the main topics which were uh, raised by the southern countries. In particular, of course, uh, uh, the need of making a feasibility studies uh, at uh, uh, regional level, but also at their national level uh, regarding uh, the sustainability 
uh, of their, uh, uh, let's say, ports uh, in terms uh, of alternative fuels. Of course, LNG is the present, but uh, uh, let's say uh, the um, uh, also the cold ironing is the is very very uh, uh, immediate. But also the next uh, challenges like uh, hydrogen and other uh, situations are becoming more and more interesting for them because, of course, they. Uh, face the need to invest now uh, uh, and to, uh, of course, uh, um, face, uh, let's say, also a situation in the Mediterranean where there are very different uh, conditions and where they have to comply with competitive situations. And, of course, uh, uh, um, we decided to target uh, the, um, the issue of uh, energy communities. Uh, why? Because uh, this is a concept uh, which is quite inclusive. Uh, and uh, from Italian experience, of course, we also have uh, quite advanced uh, legislation, which could also be interesting uh, uh, in, uh, for, for southern countries and uh, also has been uh, recently adopted a directive. So also there is the possibility to produce electricity inside a, uh, port areas uh, according to the local conditions to be uh, competitive in production of costs and also in selling electricity. And so uh, also leaving the possibility to everybody to make the choice which is better uh, for, for, for themselves. And of course, uh, the uh, let's say uh, renewal uh, of uh, fleets and vessels uh, because uh, this is the immediate need uh, that uh, in order to achieve reduction of emissions uh, and of course the ECA uh, in, 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 uh, in short will be a precondition for, for this and all, in all these uh, uh, topics we have uh, targeted some pilot projects to do uh, together uh, and uh, um, in order to, as, uh, as Edward was saying, using the same tools at the same time, but also aware that for these southern countries, uh, uh, this uh, challenge is even more, uh, uh, let's say, ambitious uh, because uh, they start from uh, uh, national situations which are uh, needing to, uh, to, done, uh, to do some steps uh, which, uh, let's say, uh, require a, a, a double effort sometimes. Thanks a lot, uh, Leonardo, uh, for the clear, uh, we say, highlight of the, of the, of the possible uh, projects coming from this um, group. Uh, Michele, I have a, a little bit of, uh, let me say, provocative, no, it's not provocative, but it's just, I mean, it's the time that we, we had, you know, it's already late. So Indeed. imagine, imagine, imagine that, uh, imagine you are a, a ship owner. Okay. Now, and uh, you have to decide uh, your strategy for uh, 2040, because I mean, you start to what you are doing now, for you, it's going to last for 20, 25 years, new, new build, new ships and so on. And now you are in front of many, many different alternatives. So you, you can go with marine fuel and put some scrubbers, and diesel and put some scrubbers, or uh, choose to, to pick cold iron or batteries, and then LNG, ammonia, methanol, hydrogen for the future, uh, or green hydrogen, uh, e-fuels. So uh, I was studying a little bit the subject, uh, also preparing some uh, events we did uh, end of October on, on hydrogen. And I was, you know, I mean, uh, my, my, my answer was, no, no, I, I don't want to be a ship owner. Now, okay? <laughs> but uh, I have also to, to support some of our customers are ship owners. So sometimes they ask me for a specific question, and of course, I cannot answer precisely. But what's what's your what uh, being this provocation what what you would do now to decide to to what which kind of new vessels to build i think that we are putting ship owners in a very difficult situation uh, because we are telling them that there is regulation that is coming and we are not telling them what regulation is we are telling them that there will be cost associated with the technology but we are not telling them how this cost is going to be coming we are telling them that there is a lot of options for them, but we are not gonna tell them whether these options will be allowed under future regulation. 
So we are making the decisions very difficult. And I don't know whether this is deliberate, but when there is uncertainty in investment, people tend, and especially in the ship owning industry, but everywhere else, because I think we also have to stop thinking the ship owners don't invest. Ship owners, when they have to, and where the market conditions are there, invest. Uh, the shipping industry has been um, among the most innovative industries uh, for, for centuries, I would say, coming up with, with wonderful pieces of innovation. But when it comes down to, to uh, environmental issues, I think there is a fundamental problem that we are not willing to recognize. And the problem is, that uh, companies are taught to compete and they compete for cost. They don't compete for the environment. The environment, it's not their bottom line, unfortunately. There is a difference between the private cost and the public cost. So regulators have to develop clear guidelines, but they have to develop clear guidelines, not uh, one day or one week or one year before the regulation comes into force. The guidelines have to be developed ahead of time. So of course, we have to give the technology and the ship owners a possibility to choose the technology that is the most suitable for them. But we need to give very clear frameworks of operation. And especially in terms of policy, we need to have a very clear policy. And that I think is very clear and important also for the Mediterranean ports. Because don't forget that whether we choose LNG or we choose ammonia, or we choose uh, onshore power supply. This has enormous cost also for the infrastructure on the ports. And this infrastructure needs to be paid somewhere. And the pockets of the ports are not bottomless or better. They are not uh, like those uh, myth where the money comes all the time. The money has to come from somewhere. Now we are choosing a model where we are asking ports to develop the infrastructure and to develop uh, for example, the onshore power supply, in essence, out of their own pockets. So we're telling them you develop that either for your own profits or you develop that with the subsidies. This is wrong. It's not wrong because it's wrong to give money to the ports. It's wrong because we have a very clear principle in European environmental policy. And the principle is that the polluter should pay. So if you have a ship which is dirty and you need to connect to onshore power supply, you need to pay for that because it's your ship that it's dirty. It's not the port that has the obligation to save the health of the communities to actually put this infrastructure in place. And the same thing goes with ammonia and everything else. Now, this links again to the problem of cooperation in the Mediterranean, because if you, if you oblige European ports to put a charge on and have to, 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 to charge the polluters, the users, for the type of infrastructure what is needed, they are putting them at a disadvantage towards their competitors because of course these ports will become more expensive. So we go back to the same to the same point, but we need to solve the problem at the, at the root of the problem. We don't need to give money to the ports so that we are implicitly subsidizing the ports in the South and the Mediterranean not to do anything. So we keep the prices low and the society is paying for the negative environmental impacts that they that the users are bringing so in that sense the, the technology we will see for the coming this the coming 15 years are extremely exciting we will see so many new technologies coming together uh, we will see technologies and types of fuels uh, competing like it was with you know there's always this example of the beta and the vhs and then nobody even knows what uh, what cassettes are and videotapes are, but I, I am old enough to remember what videotapes are. And there was at some point this new technology is competing with each other. The same thing is happening right now in shipping. In the coming 15 years, we will see wind technology. We'll see ammonia, we'll see LNG, bio LNG, I hope, because LNG unfortunately doesn't respond to a lot of the problems. We'll see biomethanol, we will see hydrogen, we will see batteries, we will see all sorts of things coming up, but we need to make it clear to the industry that this technology are needed because the regulation is clear. And unfortunately, we are still dithering and discussing. We have to set very clear standards for Europe and for the Mediterranean. Very, very precise and clear, <laughs> clear answer asking for a precise regulation. That is, ex uh, that is true. Uh, that is true that otherwise for, for a ship owner, it's really difficult to, to move. And they, they should probably uh, push more for this, uh, for more, N not to be worried about regulation, but to ask for, because if, if they, they can prepare, they can prepare for, it's, they can be prepared coming. for. It's coming, yeah. it's coming. There is no way out. 
the regulation is coming. It might be not tomorrow, maybe it's in five years. The sooner we know it, the better it is. So we can adapt and come up with the best technologies that fit to the, to, to, to the industry. Thanks. Uh, last question for you, Edward. Uh, you mentioned before short sea shipping, and you mentioned in a way uh, the, the 10T policy for this, that is motorway, motorways of the sea. You know that uh, in this context, uh, we have a new uh, docu policy document that is the new motorways of the sea detail implementation plan uh, produced by the new uh, Europe, new, relatively new already, um, European coordinator, Professor Kurbodevic, in which there are three fundamental pillars. There is, uh, there is the, 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 this, uh, the, the issue to, to, to be more open to non-European countries in terms of investment, in terms of connecting. So just uh, which are, in your views, the main uh, priorities to uh, support the motorway of the sea in the MED area uh, and which needs uh, the MED area has, uh, we have uh, for, for the near future that should be uh, taken into account in the, in the in Connecting Euro facility to uh, support and funding? Uh, for, let me say, first of all, to Michele that uh, I, I think that we have to understand that we are in this called VUCA world. I don't know if you know about the VUCA world. I, I do recommend you to, to, to go through that. It means that this is volatile, uncertain, complex, and unambiguous. And I am not sure that we will have a regulation of that because this is part of the problem of short shipping. Yeah, Alex, you're not that I'm going to another side. Because uh, there is a lot of interest going around, very big, big interest. So something which is good for someone is against the interest of another one. So this is a lot of elements uh, going around. To develop short sea shipping, I think that the first uh, thing is to try to define much better in the South. I, I talk about the Western Mediterranean, which is the one I, I know more, uh, the, which are the, let's say the points where we have to go. If you have a, a structured network in the South, it's quite, it's more easy to decide where this motorways of the sea will have to go. Motorways needs uh, volume to optimize the transactions. So one, one of the things is trying to define in a better way uh, the, the, the network. And then, uh, as you can see, Grimaldi has started, from my point of view, a new period. So we have the new Eco Valencia, this uh, new vessel of Grimaldi which is an hybrid vessel with a lot of elements uh, in the line of sustainability uh, with uh, increase of about 25% of the, of the size they achieved to have 100% of uh, capacity more in these new vessels. That means that the emissions for tone transport is very, very low. So it's... Uh, different elements uh, going around. The legislation in the South is also important. The, the structure of the legislation for the operations of the vessels in the South is quite restrictive. So this is something also that they have to understand that they have to try to find new models. They try to protect their own uh, industry, let's say, but this is absolutely against the, the development of the, of, of, of the market. In the other hand, they need to develop that because exports and international trade is one of the key elements also for the development of the countries. So they have to be much more competitive and ports are one of the main elements in competitiveness for the logistic chains. So let's say that uh, I think that they need to develop, as you have said at the beginning, knowledge, the legislation, uh, let's say more competitiveness with, among the shipping lines to build this uh, Euro-Mediterranean, well, Mediterranean network, let's say. Microphone, Alexio. I speak because because there was some uh, rumors in the house. Uh, thanks, uh, Edward, uh, and thanks to, to, to the panelists. We are perfectly in time. It's 
al past six. It was everything was perfectly in time. It was a long afternoon, but uh, really a, a great day for me. Really, I'm really excited about that. I really uh, have to thank all the speak you and all the speakers, and uh, to to and the attendees. Uh, still 50 people now. That's Alpha Six. That's uh, it's an achievement with uh, at top of 120 uh, during the, the first uh, part. Thanks to the organizer, uh, the organizer specifically to the Magellan and the Circle team, and and, and, and thanks. Uh, I would like also to, um, uh, to to the consortium first, and also a special thanks to to a friend that joined us. Uh, only at the end, so a special uh, thanks to, to, to join for, to Anna Paula Mishkita. And uh, uh, this is not the end, as, uh, as, I, as I told you, this is not the end, uh, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of the network of excellence, the beginning of how to exploit what we did in Docs the Future uh, towards a future projects in which uh, the, 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 the 17 ports could be uh, the baseline for that, but also the number of experts that are within the network of excellence uh, and then the docs the future umbrella uh, could be really part of and as you did already uh, contributing a lot to the success of uh, this uh, this journey this project that is now leading to the network of excellence thanks for everything uh, keep in touch uh, you will hear a lot about the network of excellence in 2021 and hopefully together in a physical way, uh, because it will mean that this uh, <laughs> very nasty period uh, is gone. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, have a nice evening. Enjoy and relax now. And thanks for, uh, for, the, for the very great day. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs>